take a seat. People do tend to come in a little bit um, in dribs and drabs, but for our online people, uh, we should start the session. So my name's Pam Atkinson. I work for WorkSafe Tasmania and I'm the facilitator of the Better Work Tasmania program. This is our 16th networking session, so very much uh, you can see the flavour of how we're travelling at the moment uh, with uh, covering the various sectors. So we've visited construction, mining, uh, uh, rural and a number of other uh, sectors and today the focus is on fisheries. Uh, and um, we've got a, a pretty exciting um, program here today, um, lots of speakers, so we will be travelling uh, quite quickly through. In terms of uh, the safety uh, evacuation procedures for today, uh, if an alarm should ring, then we'll be going straight out and to the left and to the outside of the building here on the car park. Uh, in terms of restrooms, they're just as you go out the door to the right. Uh, so we've covered that off. Uh, to just give you a little bit of background on the Better Work TAS program, I'll, I'll play the video. So if we could start the video, please. Better Work Tasmania is an innovative, collaborative approach to supporting and improving work health and safety in Tasmania. In 2007, following a review of work health and safety legislation, the Work Cover Tasmania Board recommended that a mechanism to reinvigorate work health and safety in Tasmania be developed. 18 months of broad community consultation followed, where over 3,000 employers and workers from businesses and organisations, large and small, were asked what they thought was needed to reinvigorate the WHS landscape. A prototype group consisting of a representative from a number of Tasmania businesses worked together on the resulting community feedback and developed the Better Work Tasmania program. Free of charge and facilitated by WorkSafe Tasmania, Better Work Tasmania provides to everyone who joins the program a consolidated source of information, as well as a virtual meeting place to network, mentor and share WHS resources and ideas. Our company is uh, committed to the safety and wellbeing of our employees and as such the Better Work Tasmania program has actually uh, benefited us through quality programs which we were able to access on the northwest coast of Tasmania. The wellbeing programs uh, offered under the, under the Better Work Tasmania uh, model I think are very, very appropriate, uh, particularly from the mental health side of things and the, and the other issues around fit for work. To, uh, allow our people to stay at work as long as they can, to enjoy their lives the best way they can and, and fulfil their lives in a safe and healthy way is really important. And the opportunity for large business to function as a mentor for smaller businesses as well. Um, I would actively encourage uh, Tasmanian businesses to get on board, sign up and take advantage of some of the excellent resources that the Better Work Tasmania initiative has delivered free of charge to the uh, community. This for me has been without doubt the most exciting project I've been involved with. And the reason it's exciting is that because we are actually seeing outcomes, we are seeing things happen and we're seeing industry respond positively to what's being done. It's quite onerous for small businesses to implement and create uh, documents and templates, policy and procedures. So if we're able to share generic documentation and templates, it is efficient on time and it provides a standard for businesses across the board. We've utilised the Better Work online platform to induct our tradespeople and incorporate this into our safety management plan. Through collaboration, the construction industry are coming together to host a forum for 100 tradespeople. The Fit for Life event will incorporate guest speakers who will pass on their expert knowledge about being fit for work and fit for life. Membership of Better Work Tasmania has been growing steadily since it was launched in April 2015 and is expected to continue growing as more and more employers and workers hear about the benefits it offers. 
Better Work Tasmania has the potential to reshape the future of WHS in Tasmania by sharing, networking, and learning through the mechanisms set up by this free program. These mechanisms are ideal for small, medium, and large businesses, both public and private, to help them to support and assist each other by providing a central resource for practical information and sharing of WHS ideas and solutions. Are you interested in joining this innovative program? Then go to www.worksafe.tas.gov.au Better Work. Across the Australian Work Health and Safety Framework, everyone has a role to play in achieving better outcomes. That gives you a sense of what the program hopes and aims to achieve. Uh, we do have some information uh, books on the on the tables, just covering how Better Work Taz was put together and what we took note from the stakeholder consultation period in order in order to build what we have today. Uh, we have some over 1,300 members now since launch three years ago, so it is travelling quite well. Uh, and by all means, if you're not a member, um, it doesn't take much to join, totally free of charge, just need a six letter password. And uh, from that point on, you'll get all the information about our events and other things as we, we go through the year. We normally have these networking sessions every eight to 10 weeks. So plenty of opportunity there to, to meet other people um, from your own sector and other sectors and uh, share ideas and thoughts about work health and safety. We also have um, our guide to the ageing workforce uh, publication on the table, so you're quite welcome to take a copy of that. I also like to note that we tend to run these sessions in, um, it's co-hosted and sponsored by the Safety Institute of Australia, so uh, I like to make note of that as well. So. Um, by all means, um, if you have a chance, get on the website for the SIA and, and check out what benefits there might be from, from joining that organisation. And uh, the other thing I'd like to note, of course, is the awards are now uh, up and running online. If you would like to submit an award for the safety awards this year, please be aware that uh, the opportunities are open to do that uh, on online. So. Please make sure you have a, a look at that. And finally, before we start with our first speaker of uh, today's session, uh, I'd also like to note that we have the advisory service here today. So up in the corner here with a show of hands, the advice, safety advisors, health and wellbeing advisors that we've got here to provide any information uh, that you'd, you'd like to, to know about. They're here as well and they have information and publications at the rear of the room. So let's get started. Our first speaker is uh, Julian Harrington, Chief Executive of the Tasmanian Seafood Industry Council. Uh, the, Julian has over 20 years experience working in the Tasmanian marine environment with a particular focus on the seafood industry. After finishing a degree in marine freshwater and Antarctic biology at UTAS, lived on Macquarie Island for 15 months where he worked with elephant seals. He was employed as a fisheries scientist at the Tasmania Aquaculture and Fisheries Institute, now IMAS, for over 11 years, where his primary research interests were South, uh, Southeast Australian commercial scallop fisheries. Since September 2015, Julian has operated as Chief Executive at the TSIC. Throughout his time at TSIC, Julian has participated in the skills, training and education space actively helping spread the seafood story in the classroom and to promote the diverse employment opportunity that exists in Tasmanian seafood. Julian's uh, title for his presentation is Casting a Safety Net into the Tasmanian Seafood Industry. I welcome Julian. Thank you very much, Pam, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I've been asked to provide a bit of a, an overview of the seafood industry and, and the maritime safety uh, culture, I suppose, within the seafood industry. I'll be fairly brief. Uh, there won't be a lot of detail, but it'll give you a bit of an indication of, of the space we currently uh, work and operate within Tasmania. Yep. 
So a brief overview of my presentation. I'll talk a very tiny weeny bit about my organisation, TISIC, uh, and the Tasmanian seafood industry. I'll set a bit of a scene around what maritime safety means in, in today's climate. Uh, I'll, I'll very briefly touch on three of the key challenges we're trying to address uh, and, and give you a bit of an indication of what we're doing as an organisation. So the Tasmanian Seafood Industry Council or TISIC is the peak body representing the interests of wild catch fishers, marine farmers and seafood processors in Tasmania. Uh, we have what many of our members call compulsory unionism. It's a compulsory levy attached to their licences, but that's what allows TISIC to provide very good and efficient representation. Uh, that's our overarching mission uh, or objective of our council, uh, but also we certainly want to ensure that our members are operating in a safe climate. We want them to be able to go home after each fishing trip or after each day's work to their family. Uh, and there are certainly some challenges involved with operating in the marine environment. If you're not aware, the Tasmanian seafood industry is actually the most valuable seafood industry in Australia. It's fast approaching a billion dollar industry. Uh, a lot of that value is off the back of the Tasmanian salmonid uh, marine farming sector. Uh, with, with ma marine farming as a whole uh, Probably a little over that value now. Values uh, differ in different places you look, uh, but marine farming is probably closer to the, the 800 plus million now uh, and growing rapidly. Uh, it's, it's seafood in general is a significant employer in Tasmania and we have a very important footprint in regional communities, uh, which is obviously a very good uh, uh, benefit for regional towns and communities. So the seafood safety scene, uh, there's approximately 1,250 domestic commercial vessels in Tasmania. Uh, 850 of those, so a significant proportion are involved with seafood operations, with 800 being classed as class three fishing vessels. So that's a fairly significant fleet of vessels that are out on the water on any given day of the year. Our vessels range from very small four and a half metre tinnies on, on trailers, that's a, a small commercial squid boat fishing in the northwest of Tasmania, um, right through to large uh, vessels that go well offshore such as Muir's vessel, uh, the, the um, auto longliner Diane or Hewan's large well boat uh, that they operate down around the channel. These vessels catch an exceptionally diverse range of seafood. Uh, Southern Calamari, Banded Morwong, Ras, amongst a whole bunch of other scale fish species. Uh, abalone, rock lobster, uh, the list goes on, I won't mention them all, uh, but along with that diversity of species comes a real diversity of gear types and, and operations to catch those species, uh, including uh, abalone dive operations with, with uh, small hooker compressors mounted on boats with hoses, uh, which you can obviously see the, the diverse range of safety challenges involved with that type of operation. Uh, we have uh, vessels that haul equipment from the seafloor with, with a diverse range of hydraulic hauling equipment uh, and heavy loads that are placed on the decks of boats. Uh, and on the bottom right corner there, uh, an aquaculture vessel with a, a differing ranges of lifting gears and lifting capacities uh, all present significant challenges, work safe challenges for our seafood industry. But possibly one of the biggest challenges is the fact that we work in a very unpredictable environment uh, where, where the ocean moves around, obviously. This is a, a photo from one of my board members, or two photos from one of my board members who spent some time on Matt Syker Island with his partner. And has recently, I'll, I'll plug his book, he's recently published a book on Matt's, his time on Matt Syker Island. And this is a photo of the same cluster of rocks on two different days. Um, so, you know, our Tasmanian marine environment is, is, is very rough at times and, and a lot of our members are out in conditions that uh, your average Joe Blow wouldn't uh, want to be out on in a boat. So all of those things combined means that seafood, fishing, tends to get classified as a dangerous occupation. Uh, I won't read those out, but they're just a couple of quick Google searches you can do. You find that, that fishermen and fishing in particular uh, rank very highly in dangerous professions at an international scale. 
So obviously all of that creates some challenges for my industry that I work in, uh, the seafood industry. And amongst that is, is a complex array of regulation, uh, mainly influenced by national and state level regulation. Uh, the key maritime safety regulations, the national standard for maritime safety. Uh, we've had one single regulator since 2013, that's the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, but that NSCV has been delivered by Marine and Safety Tasmania. Um, and it's fair to say that, that Tasmania, through MAST, was the only state to have fully conformed to the requirements of the NSCV since 2013, inclusive of uh, a full cost recovery system. Uh, so a lot of other states uh, have looked at Tasmania, understanding that, that we are what they needed to be, but most other states unfortunately didn't actually get there. So under this system delivered by MAST, uh, I know it's a bit of a, I suppose a bit of an oxymoron in some ways to say we've got an excellent safety out, um, um, record, uh, but we still have had fatalities. This is for the fishing industry, 11 fatalities since 2001. They've all been in remote areas in the south or southwest. They're all male. We've got very much a male-dominated industry. 80% were less than two nautical miles from shore. 50% were in small vessels. Three had multiple fatalities, and there were six capsizes. And it's the last dot point that is, is just really, really worrying for me. None of them were wearing a life jacket. In today's day and age where you've got yokes, You've got life jackets that are as comfortable or more comfortable than your clothing. No one was wearing life jackets. And no one had a little personal location beacon in their pocket which they could trigger off if they went overboard. So there's some pretty simple things we need to work on as an industry that can still improve safety. And obviously, like any industry, our aim as TISIC is, is to try and have zero fatalities over the next 10 years. Um, we do have a way to go to get there because we do have some challenges. One of those key challenges is, is the fact that the delivery of the NSCV will shift from MAST to the Australian Maritime Safety Authority uh, as of the 1st of July this year. It was meant to be 1st of July 2017. They had an extra 12 months to prepare themselves, but we're shifting over to, to answer in less than uh, two months. Along with that is a constant review of the rules, the regulations. Uh, a lot of systems are still not in place. Um, and, and that's for a larger organisation, a larger structured company like your, your salmon companies, they've got capacity to understand and deal and get to understand that space. But most of my members, 540 wild catch fishers are single person owner operators where the wife does the paperwork at the end of the day and does the finances at the end of the day. And there are real challenges with my smaller businesses, smaller operators, understanding the complexity and the constantly changing rules uh, and delivery model that the AMSA will, will uh, operate under. Another thing my members don't seem to understand is that every time they go to sea, they're taking on full liability for their vessel and any crew in that vessel. They also don't understand for the last dot point that there's, there's state-based legislation in the WHS space uh, that will override and will influence their operations. Um, so we've got a long way to go. Uh, in a lot of my members' views, the shift towards AMSA is going to be a step backwards for our industry in Tasmania. Uh, that's mainly because AMSA are trying to balance Tasmania, who did things very, very well up here and conform to the NSCV, and other states, and I will mention names such as Queensland, which have essentially done nothing uh, to improve or conform with the NSCV, and that's the state that continue to have significant issues around maritime safety and the vessels they put out on the water. So AMS is trying to balance those two extremes, and, and we feel as an industry we're, we're possibly getting dragged down a little bit in the maritime safety space to allow AMSA to, to deliver a system to the nation as a whole. Another challenge for us is, like a lot of sectors in Tasmania, we do have an ageing workforce, especially in the wild catch fishery. With that comes people with 30, 40, 50 years, some people 60 years experience fishing around Tasmania and it is exceptionally hard to tell them that they have to do something differently when they've been operating in the same boat sometimes for that period of time. So some of the changes that AMPS are putting forward, although they have a level of merit, 
uh, and they will improve safety and improve safety culture. It is exceptionally difficult to uh, make some of our members understand the benefits in, in the change of operation. And the last challenge I'll touch on is the fact that we have some significant mental health and wellbeing issues, especially uh, in our fishing industry. Some recent research from uh, Deakin University commissioned or, or conducted by Dr Tanya King has shown that the, sea, the fishing industry has twice the level of psychological distress. And the key triggers for that are uncertainties around resource access. If you're not aware that general community, the broader community own the marine resources and my members, the fishermen, uh, have access rights to access those resources and there's a level of uncertainty around those access rights. And another key driver of that that figure of, of, of double the, the rates of psychological distress is excessive reg regulation, excessive red tape and complexities in how our, our fisheries are, are managed and operated. Um, so this space that AMPS is stepping into, although it's an important space, it is also driving some mental health and wellbeing issues within my membership base. So ultimately all this space together, we've got an industry with a, with a preference to stay with MAST. They don't want to go to AMSA. They've got this lack of trust in AMSA and we have to try and break down some of those bridges and, and, and work towards a common goal of improved maritime safety. So what is TISIC doing to try and improve some of that space? Uh, we're fortunate enough to get the, the uh, then minister's ears, uh, Jeremy Rockcliffe, uh, prior to the state election and they've dedicated some funding uh, through election promises for us to commission a maritime safety officer. We can extend that out with further support from the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Um, so that'll allow my organisation, which is resource poor, to dedicate some firm resource, some human resource to tackle this space, which will be a huge advantage for us. We also have a very close working relationship with a dedicated training provider, Seafood Training Tasmania, and we have a close working relationship with Skills Tasmania. So we're really trying to work on ensuring we have the right level of skills and an appropriate level of skills and training being delivered to our industry. Um, and, and we're very thankful that we're able to support this space through a direct grant from Skills Tasmania to Seafood Training Tasmania, which through what's called the Seafood Pledge, that provides our industry with a level of certainty that there's subsidised training for a period of time rather than the annual uh, space of, of grants. And also we're, we're trying to drive some innovation change or some cultural change through the next workforce, the, the young workforce that we need to come through our industry. Uh, and just a little plug for a site that we have unofficially launched. It is live now. We'll officially launch it in the next couple of weeks. It's called Seafood Jobs. Uh, it's a, an online portal which is aiming to, to link everything to do with seafood. Employers with potential employees, uh, with training, uh, and we'll, we'll combine this safety, maritime safety space within this portal. And lastly, we're also partnering with Rural Alive in Tasmania. Uh, to develop some dedicated resource to educate our industry on the challenges they face in the mental health and wellbeing space. Uh, we've also got a fundraising uh, effort going. It's taken a bit of a back burner with some other issues, but we, we have the support of the Rock Lobster Association, the Tasmanian Rock Lobster Fishermen's Association, my organisation, TISIC and Seafood Training TAS. We've got 30K in a, in a kitty. We're looking at how we can value add that money uh, and provide more support to our, our sector. And look, there's a hell of a lot more we're doing in this maritime safety space. I have not got enough time today to talk about that. You'll hear a bit more about it from some of the other talkers, some of the other challenges that our industry as a whole is facing and how some of our businesses in our industry is tackling those. But I'll leave my talk there as a general overview uh, and, and you'll learn a lot more from the other presenters uh, to come. Thank you. So on to our, our next speaker, uh, Ian Miles, who is Head of Safety Tassel Group. Uh, Ian has been with Tassel since 2010 and has 20 plus years experience in risk management. Uh, the title of his presentation, Creating the Right Safety Climate, Journey from Dependent to Interdependent. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Right, we live. Sorry, I can't stand there. If I stand there, I'll just seize up and fall over and that won't be fun. Um, I'm just used to moving around and I've got to bear in mind that people are watching us on camera so I can't stray too far. Right, so the first thing we need to just clarify is what is dependence and what is interdependence? It, it's, it's not a, it might be a common term in your, 
in your company. Um, but, but quite simply, dependence means, uh, and we've got a slide on, on the characteristics of dependence, but just some context before we start is, if you've got a dependent culture, then you have a culture that needs to be told what to do all the time. Um, so you can imagine in safety, if you want people to follow rules, you've got to go and say, listen, please do this, please do that, be careful with this, watch this. We've got 1,280 people across Australia. Uh, close to 1,000 of them in Tasmania. In, the, in, in, in farming specifically, we've got just over 400 on the water as I'm standing here today. So how do you get a, an organization that's so diverse and working across such different risks to all do the right thing every single day. Well, you need to empower them and you need to give them the skills. And I cannot be there all day. I've got four of my team or three of my team here today. They can't be there every single day. It's impossible. But you see, if we had a dependent culture, that's exactly what it would mean. It would mean that the safety professional needs to be on the site with the people, working with them every single day. It's impossible. You'd over-resource your work health and safety department. You'd literally need to have 200 safety people just to keep track of 400 people, right? It cannot be done. So what we had to do a few years ago is have a good hard look at ourselves and say, right, where do we want to go and how do we want to make this work? Just some background. The big issue was at that time, 2000, late 2010, 2011, we had injuries that were in simple terms through the roof. They were inconsistent every month. It would be up, down, up, down, up, down. There was no consistency. Put a recipe for disaster. I mean, if any company had that record today, you'd be frowning at them and saying, listen, hold a second, you're just taking too much risk, All right? So that was the reality. Um, and the question was asked, how do we achieve consistency? Number one, you want to stabilize that injury trend, but not only stabilize it, how do you reduce it? Because clearly where we were was just not good enough, right? Everybody's aware in the, in, the, in the safety circles of a bird's theory. You know, you're going to have so many near misses and you're going to have so many incidents and eventually you're going to have one that isn't a near miss and it's going to be pretty dead serious in the true sense of the word. So what we did was we decided to make a change and, and this is just an example. So see this as a bit of a look-see on how TASAL went about doing what they're doing and we're not saying we're perfect but we've got something right in a huge organization and you can use any change model you want to. It doesn't really matter. The important thing to, to understand, Jerry, is that people, there's a common phrase, people don't like change. That's perhaps not entirely true. People don't mind change if it is managed correctly, right? The worst thing you can do is throw a safety system at people and say, follow it. This is why the safety professional has such a bad rap. It's because we're known as the fun police and, oh, listen, if you, if you want to slow things down, just call the safety guy. But this is the whole thing. So what you really need to do is put this ball in their court and say, okay, listen, you're in charge of your own safety. Our, uh, uh, we've explained your obligations to you, you know, and we're going to give you everything to be able to do your job successfully. That includes training. It includes motivation. It in we're taking away every single stumbling block possible. But it's actually up to you. And this is why I chose this one. This is Cotter's change model. As I said, there's many change models. But the important thing to understand is if you're going to embark on a change and if you want to make a difference, you need to understand characteristics of people. And that people don't mind change if it comes with transparency and it comes with simplicity. The worst thing you can do is make it complicated. Right, so let's not worry about that too much. I, I do break it down. So if you look at, you know, the first piece is creating a climate for change. Well, that was easy was really easy. I looked at the incidents and I said, wow, we're on a, on a road for a train smash here. This is going to be a disaster if we don't get a control of this situation. And then, thankfully, we had the impending harmonization. And you know what that did? That made directors accountable. So it was an easy sell. Honestly, it was an easy sell. Okay? Um, so let, let, let's start with that. So first things first. Um, the urgency was there. Although we were anticipating the change in 2011 in harmonization, it actually occurred in 2012, that was all right. We started preparing late in 2010. It was one of my first tasks is to get this ready and to put the framework, uh, the framework uh, around our systems. This presentation is not about systems. It is assuming that your systems are in place. But I'll tell you a little secret. Your systems are only going to get you a certain way. 
or a, a certain distance. You're only going to be so effective if you rely on your systems. And that's what this is about. So we, we had to build a guiding team. We had to get the right vision. This is ours. Don't worry too much about it. Just understand, have a look in the future. And really my question to you is, what does success look like? What do you want to achieve in two years, five years, seven years? What do you want to be known as? And what do you want to be seen as? So we developed our own vision. It's really based on uh, something that I'm passionate about. Why is that important? Because success of a strategy is really in the implementation, but it revolves around three key things. Number one, understand what you're passionate about. Don't choose something that you're not passionate about. You're not going to be able to wake up in the morning forever and do this thing because you're going to run out of energy. The second thing you need to understand is what you can be the best in the world at. And that sounds a bit presumptuous and wow, geez, you're thinking a bit big. But if you can't be the best in the world at it, because if you're passionate about something and you really have the natural aptitude to do it, you can be the best in the world at it. You just need to put your mind to it. And last but not least is what drives your economic engine. Now in safety, there's not necessarily an, an, an economic engine, but what there is is what drives your engine, and that is compliance. We're going to get to that later. I want to show you something about our vision is that it doesn't revolve around the rules. Why? What you're trying to do is bring people on a journey and you need to get people to buy into what you want to achieve in the future. So you want to surround yourself with like-minded people, not so? So could you imagine in an ideal world, and I always have a chuckle in my staff uh, grimace when I say this, is could you imagine if everybody was a pas as passionate about being successful and about a very good safety climate as me, it would be very easy, right? And I, and I say that with all you, the, the, the sad part is that if everybody was like me, we wouldn't have a business, all right? Because I, I'm not necessarily too concerned about how much money we spend on something, I just want it right. So the accountants and me tend to have a bit of a discussion. It's gone dead. Uh, uh, about, about, listen, we, we can't do this. And I say, well, why not? You know, we should be able to do this. So you need to take that in consideration. Not everybody can be like me, but the objective is for me to surround myself with people that buy into this vision. Because it's them that's going to be driving the workforce, not me. I might see our people, let's take on average, I'll see everybody maybe once or twice a year. That is not enough time for me to instruct them on how I want them to behave. I've got to teach other people They've got to be passionate about it. They've got to go and teach other people, and so we build this little program. Right. The key here is that we're really talking about a take care approach and an I care for approach. And we've got quite a simple, uh, simple one. What do we take care of? People. What do we care for? People. What do we take care of? The planet. What do I care for? The planet. So it's really I take care of and I care for people, planet, product, that's important, and performance. That's what we care about. That's the, that's the essence of our zero harm vision. And I know this thing called zero harm has been flogged to death by safety professionals. This is a different take on it. We're not talking from a pure compliance perspective. We're talking from a human perspective of it's about the attitude you have towards everything you're doing. Do it once, do it properly, do it right. Right. So, you know, at the center of this is, as I said, I take care of and I care for people, planet, product and performance. And what we're really working towards is zero serious or insignificant incidents and zero legislative breaches. That's important. Okay? This is our license to operate. If we start becoming non-compliant in either environmental issues or in work health and safety issues or in financial issues, we're not going to have a business. We're a listed company. We've got a lot of rules. We respect those rules. And it's not a problem to us. So how do we go? 2010, we're sitting there thinking about this and we put the plan in place and we do a little bit of dreaming. We say, this is what we'd like to do. First of all, we'd like to implement controls. That's a given. Harmonization is coming up on us. We really need to align our systems with the Work Health and Safety Act and with all the standards or national standards that are appropriate to our business. So we do that. And there's an expectation, once you do that, that people follow them. So yes, we drew a line in the sand, literally. And we said, right, this is the system we want you to follow. This is the reason we, why, you want, why we want you to follow it. And this is the outcome we want. And so what was the outcome? Well, the truth of the matter is that if we continued, and I, I got a walk there to explain it to you. 
probably can't. Right. But if you look at that line, you do get a result from putting a system in that is just rules. Let's not make a mistake. If people simply follow the rule because they have to, it does make a difference. It gets you a ways. It gets you about 80%, maybe 60%. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the time it will take you to create a change, it will take you, you see where the red dot's going, way off screen. I worked out it will take us 10 years to get down to an acceptable level of injuries. We didn't have 10 years. In my mind, we needed to turn the ship around in six months to a year. Because if we couldn't, we were, no, we were heading in, 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 in the wrong direction. Here comes the second piece of the puzzle. We wanted to get that trend to move on that gradual line to much steeper curve. We needed to see a difference in one to two years, a significant difference. And therefore, we started to work on a program that improved the safety climate. So now you must be asking yourself, so what's the difference between the safety climate and the safety culture? Well, I'll explain it like this. Culture can be seen as this thing called climate change. Okay? You hear about it. It's spoken about. But if you don't really take notice and sit outside and do a time-lapse camera, you might not feel it. It's almost like the frog in the hot water situation. Okay? It's gradual. Eventually, over seven years, you get, you get climate change. That's what culture is. Culture develops over seven years, either good or bad. But safety climate is tangible. It's what you can see and feel on a daily basis. That I can describe as the weather outside. When it's raining in Tassie, you know it's raining in Tassie. When it's snowing on Mount Wellington and you live in Hobart, you know it's snowing on Mount Wellington. You can feel it and you can see it. That is climate. So what you need to do in order to change... So, so, so in order to, for the weather to change or the, the climate, uh, the, the, the um, change in weather patterns long term to change, these daily events occur. It's the same with culture. If you want to change your culture, you have to change the climate, the safety climate. It's a, you've got to change the way people do things. You've got to change what they do and you've got to be, make things habit. I'll, I'll move on. Right, so there you go. That was the expectation. That was beginning with the end in mind. We looked at where we are now and we said that's where we want to be. So you have a look into the future and you determine how you want to achieve it. You can use any model you want to. I just use this one. Right. So the first thing was engage and empower the team. This is very important. You need to communicate for buying. Remember what I said is people do not like to be left in the dark. You don't just go to somebody and say, there you go, mate. You need to now follow that. And you don't tell them why. People hate that. You're not, you, all you're going to do is get people off sides. And they're going to call you the fun police. And they're going to call you all sorts of other names behind your back. The important thing is to explain to them why they need to buy into this change. So we used a lot of examples. Number one, uh, you, know, you know why we want you to do JSAs? Well, quite simply, we want you to pro apply the think process. So before you jump in and get hurt, or jump in and do something and then realize you've got to redo it, we just want you to take five. Stand back for a few seconds, think about what you want to do. If you're unsure, talk to your mates, make a plan. Because what we want you to do really is to do it the first time correctly. So how did that help us? Well, it improved our productivity, it improved our efficiencies, it improved our quality of our work, and what was the result? It improved our safety. You see, people think you've got a safety problem, but you actually don't have a safety problem. What you really got is an operational practice problem, or you've got a human resource problem. The injury is only the result of all these other issues that you've got. So you've got to resolve those in your whole safety system. Okay? So how did we create the right climate? We chose a model called the Bradley Curve only because it does exactly what we wanted it to do. It moves people from, whoops, sorry, from dependent to, to independent, uh, interdependent. So what is the difference? Well, the difference is quite simply in a dependent culture, Everybody has this care for me attitude. You can imagine with 1,280 employees how difficult that will be. There, management enforce the rules and compliance is a focus. There are companies that use the strategy as I've showed you. You can use it. It will only get you to 60 to 80%. You cannot have an expectation of zero harm if you just run a compliance program. You might have very demotivated staff at the end of it. All right. Second phase of this of this climate change, 
process is independent. That's a good place to be because yeah, people know enough and they have bought in enough to the program to be interested enough to follow rules willingly. That's good. Most people would identify with that. But here's the, here's the secret. How do you get in a marine environment and what Julian was talking about, how do you get those private enterprises to ensure that they operate at zero harm? No significant incidents and always compliant is that they need to be interdependent. And this is where that I care for and I care, uh, I take care of approach comes for. You see, because if I'm working with you and I see you do something that doesn't match what I've been told or taught or what I buy into, it doesn't match with our, with our zero harm vision. I have a very nice way of saying, mate, just be careful. Could you please just stand back? That crane's moving across. You need to just be out of the way because it's going to hit you. You see, so what you really have then is you actually have 1,280 people looking out for 1,280 people. It's as simple as falling out of a tree. If you could get everybody to do that, of course. Right. So there are challenges. I'm not suggesting there's not challenges. But that is the essence of having an interdependent workforce. We put a program together. Uh, we identified what are the characteristics that we would like to see from the program. It is very important that you understand what it looks like. Remember I said to you that climate is like the weather outside. You want to be able to, if it's raining, somebody doesn't come to me and say, listen, the sun's shining. Likewise, if I see something, people can't fool me and say, oh, we've got an interdependent culture. I'll say, no, you don't, because I still see incidents occurring with a large amount of operator behavior. So that means people aren't following the rules willingly. They're doing the wrong thing. The behaviors are incorrect. They're jumping off cranes. They're bomb diving off the, off, the, off, the, off the vessels because they think it's fun. That's not the behavior we're trying to encourage here. Okay? So I can identify by, by looking at some of those. And this is, this is just a snapshot. There's many, many characteristics. But quite honestly, if I go out there and I have to be very, very aware of where we are. Why? Because based on where we are and what I see, I would direct my team in certain directions. And I'd say, hold a second, that site, I think you've got too many of these behaviors in an dependent site. We need to work on them. And we've got specific tools and we've got specific strategies to move people from phase to phase to phase. Because it's all about, it's all about creating habits. So, yeah, you can imagine, if you have a dependent culture, zero is unrealistic. And zero I'm speaking about here is zero significant incidents. It's unrealistic. Everybody is on their own mission. That mission, heaven only knows what it is. It's not yours. It's their own mission. That's dependence. Okay? In the independent stage, they can actually achieve zero by chance. It's not a bad place to be, but it's not a good place to stay. Because there, people know what to do. They largely follow the rules. They're willing. They're involved in safety meetings. They're part of it, but they're there for themselves. It's all about them, them, them. Not a bad place to be. But what you really want is eyes behind your head. And how do you get that? You go to interdependence. When I'm doing something, and if I'm doing it incorrectly, Tony has the comfort to say to me, Ian, be careful. Crane's moving. Forklift's moving move out the way, or I saw you walk down that path there and you weren't on the walkway, so you need to have a high-vis vest on because there's trucks in the vicinity. You see, we don't take offense to that. That's just him looking out for me, and I understand that. And everybody else in Tassel understands that too. Okay, so here's our whole program. So really what I was trying to explain here is that, um, quite simply, you always start with knowledge of your systems as the base and the foundation. It is important, anybody at any stage of their lifespan in Tassel have to have the knowledge of, they need to know the rule, they need to know why we have the rule, they need to know how to comply to the rule, they need to have all this training and all this stuff done. You can essentially say the first day they walk in the business, we start with a, with a safety induction, and that safety induction process with, um, with a specialist takes four days to conclude. After four days, he hands them over to a supervisor and it takes a further month to three months to get them signed off on the relevant policies and procedures. It's a process. Induction is not an event. Don't fool yourself. When you're trying to create change, induction is not an event. It's a process. Right? The event on the first day, or in, in our case, the first four days, is simply setting them up for success for the next three months and their careers. 
takes, it takes a while. The more complex the work, more high risk the work, the longer the process. It's that simple. Okay. Uh, the second thing is they really need to master forms of communication and consultation. Remember, we're all in this together. You're not a mushroom growing up in the dark if you work for Tassel. You have to learn to communicate in the right way with your colleagues in order to be successful. So we encourage people to speak up. If you're doing something well, you know what, a pat in the back. If you're doing something not so well, take them aside and say, mate, can I just show you how to do that well? So that's what I mean, we need to get these things in place. Observation and opportunity is a good one. Observation and opportunity is really about hazard control and about a risk identification. So uh, if Brett comes to our site, what he likes to see is that people are observant of what's happening around them. You mustn't be blind to what's happening around you. It is important from us, we have a metric, you know, how many hazards we get from the, from the staff, we monitor that. If I don't see enough hazards coming through or if I don't see enough uh, things being picked up, I know something's wrong because anybody who's worked in the marine environment knows that on every single day, there are a gazillion risks facing the people. If I'm not hearing about those risks, it tells me that something's off. Either their eyes aren't wide open and that's gonna to lead to a disaster imminently, or they're becoming comfortable with their surroundings, that's also gonna to lead to disaster, or they're just not communicating well enough, which is the standard in our business, that's also gonna to lead to disaster because that means I'm not telling you, watch out for this, be careful of this, we're doing this well, good going, it's about communication. And last but not least, resilient leadership. I'll stop there because I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So how do you make all this stick? I've said a lot, the important thing is you need to make it stick. And really the, the phase I use is you repeat, you repeat, you repeat until it becomes habit. The tools and the techniques we use to move people from dependence to interdependence through to, or indep uh, independence to interdependence are built into our safety system with the sole purpose of changing behaviors. You see, once they become, it becomes a habit, it becomes part of your culture. That's how you change your culture. The more ha good habits you have, the better the culture is. You see, the right safety climate, in other words, I need to create a climate as a manager where people, number one, want to contribute, that they feel valued contributing, and they can all buy into where we're going. And when we get there, that they all feel that we've been successful. That's the important part. Right. And I've said there, and this is a bit of a, you know, it, it, it's very, very, very true. Changing the behavior of a thousand people is easy. All you need to do is change the behavior of 15 leaders. And that's not so easy. Okay, so we give them a little bit of something to hang on to. We have a concept, and if anybody's read Jim Collins' work, and I'm a fan of his work, in one of his books, Good to Great, he describes this thing called the flywheel. He actually calls it the flywheel and the, and the doom loop. But um, we've rebranded it, calling it the flywheel and the fruit loop, because it's a good demonstration. So in contrast, the flywheel gives you momentum. The flywheel it, by its very nature is once it's got momentum it doesn't easily stop and very importantly once it has momentum you cannot easily change the direction of that flywheel you can go and test it tonight I don't know if you had one of those things as a kid those toys that you spin like that once that thing is spinning it's it's pretty rigid and tight it doesn't waver and it doesn't change direction that's the concept that we want to do show you and really what we're saying is that the safety flywheel is made up of three things quite simply. If we do these three things in TASEL and we get them right, we will be successful. The first one was, what can we be the best in the world at? Remember I said to you, what is it that we can be the best in the world at? Our risk control model is developed for us. It's part of our compliance system, part of our work health and safety system. It is important. It's how we control work health and safety risks. We can be the best in the world at it. And every day when we wake up, we, we put that hat on and we say, I'm going to be the best at this, right? Because if you can't control the risks, that's where the issues come from. Second thing is, what are we very passionate about? Resilient leadership. Why? Because resilient leaders drive the right safety climate. They are the ones that drive the right safety climate uh, or, or create the right safety culture. Remember I said to move a thousand or to change the hearts and minds of a thousand people is easy. You just need to change the hearts and minds of 15 managers, 15 senior people. And that's why resilient leadership is very, very important to us. And last but not least, what drives our engine? 
compliance. It goes without saying that in a very regulated environment, like we have in Tasmania, for both for the environment and both for health and safety and for quality and for people, compliance is a given. Seven years ago when we started this program, I've got to tell you how many arguments I had with people about they don't want to follow the rule. I have never had that argument in five years. People understand why we've got the rule, they appreciate the rule, they respect the rule and they do it. You see, that's a very different place where you're coming from. It's not a burden to be compliant. It's actually a privilege to have a license to operate in an industry like ours. And Julian was telling you about how many um, vessels and how many people work in the industry and all that good stuff. You see, you more than just in a day-to-day -day job. You're in an industry that feeds a nation. Every bit of product that is bought, or sorry, that is caught or grown in our sector is actually consumed. And that's quite profound. It's, it's very different to a lot of other industries, right? Yes, and we've got our challenges. The objective here is just to think of the good things we're doing and, 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 and appreciate those successes. And being compliant is one of them. Easy, easy. Okay? So really, the concept here is just simplicity. So if, if the manager can remember this, I need to be a good, resilient safety leader. I always need to remember to be compliant. That is important, and I do it with a big fat smile on my face and I'm happy and I've got it down pat and so is my team. And last but not least, I know how to manage my risks. If I follow the risk control model, it's a thought process, I'm gonna get this right, okay? So, is it working? Well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating because let me tell you, for me to convince people seven years ago that this would work, I couldn't. I, I, I had to um, sort of bluff my way and, and, and what is, what is um, you know, some people said or some person said, listen, what you really need to do is you, you, you first need to bluff your way until you can find your way. I was almost in that kind of mode. I knew where I wanted to go, but I was trying to, the thing is to try and convince people to follow me. That was the challenge. You need to get people that you can surround yourself with the same vision. Listen, we can get this right. You know why? Because we actually give a damn. We actually care enough to get this right. And if that's what's driving us every single day, we can get out of bed in the morning with a step, with a bounce in our step. And if I surrounded myself with people like that, it would be successful. So look where we're going. TRIFR, you're all familiar with the term. Total recordable injury frequency rate, that's made up of fatalities, lost time injuries, MTIs and RWIs, restricted work injuries. 2011, and that was sort of january we were at a high 123. That's almost a cricket score, or some countries would hope they could get a cricket score like that. Um, and that's not where we wanted to be. Where we are now, year to date, 11.86. And I'm not standing here saying, listen, I'm, I'm boasting about those figures. We, we're not where we want to be, according to our standards. I've just benchmarked us. According to the industry, we're ahead of the curve in most metrics, but we're not where we want to be. Where we want to be is sub 10, and the reason for that is because it equates to a number of medically treated injuries. We're currently on 19. This is at the end of last month. It's 19 too many, and I do this exercise. I put a cup on the table with straws, and, and as a percentage of the total employees uh, in the business, I cut some straw short. It's a bit of an eye-opener. And during a training session like this, I'd say, please take the straw out of your cup. And if you got the, wrong, the, got the right straw, please go and stand in the corner because you're injured and you're not part of this team anymore. How do you feel about that? You see, that's a real life example of what we're saying when we set goals and be very careful to set goals, understand what it really means. Because what we're really saying is that 19 people are going to have a medically treated injury. Now in an organization that's got 1,280 people, you might, you might say, okay, listen, that's acceptable. Every year we have an objective to bring that down. LTIFR, it was right up there in 2009, somewhere around there. And I just showed you because it was pretty gradual, 2011, 16, and then we saw the sudden drop off because we started seeing some benefits from our program. And we're currently seeing a 0.46. It's one LTI out of 1,280 people. Um, also, once again, we're not proud of the fact that we've got the one. We shouldn't have had the one. It was unnecessary. Um, it was avoidable. And, yeah, that's the long and the short of it. It shouldn't have happened, quite simply. 
MTIFR, 11.4, of, of course th those there and those there make up that number because we don't have any restricted work injuries, we don't have any fatalities. Thank goodness for that. Those are just the numbers. To give you an idea, you can actually see the numbers of MTI. So the gray column is really the, 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 the bulk of it. Those are medically treated injuries. The numbers we were having every single month or, or every single year, sorry. Um, you know, 113, 116 people having an injury significant enough to receive medical treatment, whereas now we're down to 19. And we aim to get that really, really down um, to where we're going. All right, so just thought I'd show you that. Um, you know, I hope there's something in that presentation that you can take home. It's, it's, it's not a traditional safety presentation, but I think it is important to understand that if you're running a compliance system, you're only going to get a certain amount of the way. If you want to get all the way, you need to actually change people's hearts and minds. You need to get them on the journey with you. And the move, the model from dependence to interdependence to us was vital because we've got 1,280 people. There was no way that I was going to be able to keep track of everybody every single day. The reason I can stand here today quite calmly and say to you, I know that the team is doing good work out there, is because we've invested seven to eight years of our time building that team. And there was one significant difference. When, when we chose or when the CEO asked who is the guiding team, the assumption is that it's going to be me and it's going to be three or four other key executives. And when I said to him, at the time we had 683, I remember the number, 683 employees in 2010. He said, who's the guiding team? I said, all 683 people. He's like, wow, that's not achievable, is it? Yes, it is. You see, if everybody is on board, they will make disciples of everybody else. It's that simple. There's people out there that buy into this process. I do not need to convince the new people coming on board because I've got staff that do it, the managers do it. Everybody knows this is what we believe in. Right, I've got to stop rambling because there was no time limit, but I've got to be disciplined. Sorry, I'm just a <laughs> little passionate. Any comments or questions? Happy to take them? No? The bulk of you are still awake. That's good to see. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ian. Great insights in uh, the cultural journey for TASEL. Uh, now, we've all been sitting for all, about an hour now, and um, true to what we always do in our Better Work TAS networking sessions, um, we like to uh, encourage the networking and sharing. So we'll do a, a pause and stretch session now. So if you'd all like to stand. And for the next couple of minutes, if you'd like to chat to another person at your table about what you learnt from Ian's session, and, uh, and then also reverse that. So uh, we'll, we'll do that for the next five minutes or so. Thank you.
Okay, everybody, if we'd like to take our seats again to um, start with the next presentation. We are running just about on schedule, which is always a good thing. So our next speaker is Stuart Lovell. Uh, Stuart is the Work Health and Safety Manager for Hewan Aquaculture. Stuart has a graduate diploma in Work Health and Safety in Risk Management and a certified practicing risk manager. Uh, he has over 20 years experience in the Work Health and Safety environment. Uh, the title of Stuart's presentation today, Alcohol and Drugs Program, Hewan Aquaculture Group Limited. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Um, when I was asked to give this presentation, um, I thought, well, what the hell am I going to talk about first? But then I decided what I'd do is I'd just run you guys through a bit of a story, a bit of a journey of, about what I actually observed coming into a new business. So I've only been with you on since January last year, uh, so still new to this game and this industry. So a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm presenting here, you guys will be pretty familiar with, but also what I'm trying to do is give you guys some practical examples and some takeaways of some issues that I was faced with. So if this will work. So a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm not going to really go through and give a lot of statistical information about our program and the results and, and what we found. It's more or less around the behaviours, the observation, the culture that was spoken about before. Uh, so the stuff that I actually observed. And then we had a situation and how we dealt with it. So pretty much it's about our experiences and about our, our strategy to deal with a specific risk that we uh, came across in the workplace. So alcohol and other drug use in society, well, why do people use drugs and alcohol? Number of reasons, you've got them up there, I'm not gonna speak to them all, but, and everybody's different, but the reality is that they're out there and illicit drugs are out there as well. You've only just gotta take a cross section of society, so you'd be pretty naive to think that you're not faced with a drug and alcohol problem in your workplace because you, uh, it's just a general reflection of society. So just have a think about alcohol and other drug use. Do you think that's increased in the last 10 or 15 years? What type of drugs are getting into the market now? What type of drugs are getting into the workplace? What's the drug of choice of kids? I've got kids now and they, they say, Dad, I can get anything I want whenever I want at any time. It scares the absolute bejesus out of me, but that's the reality of it. So if you think it's not an issue in your workplace, you're running, you're running pretty blind. So. so, I mean, look at the positive side of things as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. We do, we're a social bunch, we're social animals. We do a lot of these things to help us relax. We socialise, we have a beer, we celebrate, we commiserate, all of these things. So it's in there. We're all, we're all guilty of using drugs and alcohol. That's fine, but when does it become a problem? So up on the board, there's a couple of little examples of when it will become a problem. So we've all got different reasons for using drugs and alcohol. And I'm not up here to preach. I'm not the fun police. But um, when it starts to become one of these, one of these little issues up here, one of they, one, when one of those things starts to become prevalent, you've got to have to ask yourself a few questions. Do you need some assistance with intervention, etc.? So when somebody finally admits that they need the drug or alcohol to, to cope with day-to-day -day situations, you know you've got a bit of a problem. So why would this be any different at work? We all know the legislation behind it all. We, we know what the PCB, what's expected of the PCBU in relation to providing safe place of work, safe systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but look at all the other things there. Just have a look at that picture. That's our our maintenance crew, they're doing a bit of work on a boat. So um, obviously we don't want to hurt those guys. We don't want those guys to hurt each other. But what about the product they're building in the background there? So if they're under the influence of alcohol and other drugs and they're out in the water, all of a sudden there's seven or eight guys that are compromised by something that may have happened six, seven months ago when they're building that boat. So the risks, you can see they're pretty obvious. I don't have to tell you what the risks are in relation to, to drugs and alcohol in the workplace. Um, but some of the not so obvious ones there are the conflicts and, and those things that can arise and the public risk and the fatigue and all of that stuff that can be caused by it. So it's pretty obvious that drugs and alcohol don't mix at work. 
So, what are we going to do about these things? I'll give you a little bit of a story about our experience uh, and the stuff that I was faced with. So, if you rewind back to January 2017 when I joined the business, observation. So, the guys had a pretty, what we thought, rigid alcohol testing regime in place. So, had a pretty sound policy and procedure, so that was good. Um, Work health, health and safety advisors were trained to take the test samples. Some of them are in the room and they did a fantastic job at doing that. The equipment that we used was supplied by a third party, but it was, it was uh, stored, maintained by us and the consumables were bought in. And the instruction to the safety team was that they had set KPIs, so they had to do X amount of tests per month, which they did very well. There's the opportunity for cause testing as well. So if somebody turned up to work and they saw that somebody was behaving a little bit irrationally, they could put their hand up and say, need to get this guy on the blower, I think he might have had a few sherbets at lunchtime, whatever. And then there was a disciplinary process that would follow from that, which is all great. That was really good. But there were a couple of issues that I spotted from that. So what I decided to do was put together a strategy and take a five-step approach in relation to this. So this was built into a general operational plan that the issue of um, drug and alcohol testing was to be reviewed. How are we going to go about that? So sat down, had a bit of a think about it, and the five steps, pretty obvious, there's no rocket science here, but go through the phase of just sitting back and observing what happens at the moment. Like the screen going blank. <laughs> oh, we're back. So, as was spoken about in the last presentation about having a look at that culture and how you describe culture, well, culture is different things to different people and it can change like that for the better, for the worse. So, just sit back. I needed to have a look at not only the culture of the workplace and have a look at the people that were being tested, but how my team approached it and how they were dealt with and how they were interacted with. And being new into the business, I was a little bit nervous about approaching these guys because I didn't know what they thought of it. I thought they might have thought that oh, it might have been great for them to get out and about, go and give someone a breath oh, get them test. That might have been, they might have enjoyed that. I was wrong, but anyway. So the next step was then to actually plan a course of action and then communicate that plan across the business and then go through a whole consultation process and then get some cooperation and review. So there's no rocket science in that, guys. That's just a pretty straightforward approach, but it's to have a framework around it so that we've got a step and everybody's on board and, and knows what we're, we're doing. So I'll just go through a couple of the, the issues that I observed. So I took a look, look at the actual process that we undertook. And as I said, what was the feeling amongst the workplace? I was listening to the guys before they were getting drug tested. I was watching to see what they did after they got tested. And there was a lot of commentary around, um, I beat you again. It didn't get me again, this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, why would people be saying this? Like, what's, where's the issue here? So I observed um, an actual scenario. One of the, what happened is the guys, our guys turned up on a site and I watched what happened. So this is a typical, this is what the guys were taught to do. They got five people into a room, they got five lick sticks, they wrote their names on the back of them, they were put onto a table at the back of the room while everybody stood around, waited for the results to come through, and then they were put on the breathalyzer. That's what they were trained to do. That's what the provider trained our guys to do. I'm standing here going, geez, I hope we don't get a positive result, because I know what I'd be saying if that was my sample and I got a positive result. So starting to build up some, some feel on, and I'm thinking, well, this can't be right. This, if, if we do get a positive result, I, I'm not confident that we've got a proper chain of custody here. I'm not confident that I'm going to be able to deal with somebody if they start to flare up about it, etc. So there were some obvious, obvious things around it. And, and one of the main things to me was it was obvious there was no actual education and awareness around it. It was just, here we are, we're going to do a drug test. You know you should be drug free and you should be alcohol free. That's, that was about it. There was no other education and awareness around the process. It was a pretty punitive approach, so pretty much if you, if you failed your drug test, there would be consequences. And as I said, there was that, we beat you again, you can't catch me. I just observed that and got that feeling that it was a little bit of a competition that the guys were going, well, I know if I have 20 beers, 
at eight o'clock tomorrow night. I know Crossy's coming in at six in the morning, I'll be right, that kind of thing. That's not what the whole program was about. That's not what we're trying to deliver. The other issue was that I got the feeling that it exposed my guys to a risk as well. So my guys that were going out and actually testing were exposed to the risk that outside, they're gonna to have to deal with these guys in the pub or in, in society. They're gonna to have to deal with their wives and all of this stuff. So there's no support for my guys as well. So at this point in time, this is when I set the plan in place. So this is where I had a look around what consultation needed to happen. Had to have a look at our policy to see if it did need review because there were a couple of little things in there that, that didn't quite add up to us. Um, and at the same time, I really thought, I don't think it's fair that my health and safety advisors are drug testing. That's part of their role, it's not their role. Yeah, okay, it's costing the business X amount per test, but there are people out there who do this for a living and do it really well. So smart business, why don't we get somebody external in? So before I did that, I consulted with these guys. So I did have a bit of a relationship with a provider, a local provider, and how we have had some success in the past putting to, together a program and getting some really good results. Um, and that program was all around, based around education and awareness and around safety rather than taking a punitive approach. So my plan was, as you can see up on, on the slide there, the, the second last point was one that stuck in my mind as well, family support. So in a previous business that I've worked in, I had guys that would come off the factory floor after they'd been through some sessions and they said to me, if only my 16 year old son had just gone through an education and awareness session around drugs and alcohol in the workplace or in society, that would be fantastic because he'd probably get more out of it than me. And I thought, well, why can't we do that? What's the reason? There's no reason that we can't get families involved in our program. So we extended that out or that was part of the plan. So right at this point in time where I've got my plan together and I'm sitting there beautifully as every safety professional, professional would, putting my framework together, get a knock on the door, one of my other safety advisors come, comes to me with a bit of information. That been given to him that somebody ha had observed somebody else on a work site and that illicit drugs was an issue. So I'm faced with this, well, what do I do now? Think about it for a little bit and I ask some questions uh, to get a few more facts around it all. I'm thinking to myself, is this just a disgruntled employee who's got a beef with another individual and wants to try and get these, them into trouble? Then I stopped and I thought, well, even if it is, can I afford to risk that if there's been, and I'm not going to go into details about it, but there's been an allegation that's pretty significant to me and it's pretty serious, uh, what do I do? So I thought about it, but not for long. Um, the, the decision was pretty easy. I got the external providers to come in and test that person on, on the spot, test that, uh, that team of people on the spot actually. So, um, and I won't go through the results just yet, but anyway. So at this point in time, you can imagine we've got a plan in place, we've had an incident, and that sort of thrown my plans up in the air a little bit. So my communication had to change. So we had to, all of a sudden, instead of where we had plan, a planned rollout of, of consultation and communication, we had to get out to the guys pretty quickly to say, zero tolerance for this kind of stuff, we need to do a blanket test across the whole business to make sure that our risk level is what we think it is. Um, because we were sort of being blissfully unaware of the actual, uh, that the risk that was being posed to us. So that was the original plan and that's what it would have been like in a, in a, a real world, but we had to change things up and, and fast track some things. Being mindful that we've got other issues going on in relation to the incident that's been raised, so had to involve the unions and talk to the unions, or didn't have to, but we decided to because we thought that would be a smart thing to do. So the whole aim of the communication process was, the, was quite simply, what are we going to do, why are we doing it, how are we going to go about it, uh, who would be doing it, when would we be doing it, and then we'd base it all around this education and awareness. So that was our strategy in relation to the communication. Obviously with communication comes the consultation. So at the same point here, is that why reinvent the wheel with our consultation? It's, it's legislated what the best practice is and it's also in our enterprise agreement on how we should consult with our workers. So we just followed exactly the same process with this subject of, of uh, drug testing or the drug and alcohol management program within the workplace. So there you go, there's some, some things that we, we did. We involved our HSRs uh, because they are an extension of the safety team. 
we used existing meeting formats. So at toolbox meetings and at managers meetings, we would bring up the issue, this is what we're going to do, this is why we're going to be doing it. Our long-term plan is to have a random program, but we've got an immediate issue that we need to deal with, so we need to roll that out. But we also listen to the concerns of people as well, so that we would then, if there were any issues, we'd get those resolved before they actually became reality. Um, and our message all along was this is all about safety. It's all about your safety. We're not trying to catch people out and get rid of them. If we do catch people, that's great because we've probably saved a fatality, but we've got to think of that individual as well. So we're not going to just leave that individual out in the cold. So we're going to actually, we've got to have some framework around how we're going to manage that individual who has either just made a mistake or may have a legitimate drug and alcohol problem that we need to deal with. So. The result about this was we have now a clear policy, so uh, there's no greyness, it's pretty black and white, and we've got a defined procedure around how things will occur with the random testing, and that they are complete. We can put our hand on our heart and say that this testing is completely random. So, following on from the consultation is the, at the cooperation phase. Now, this is all around partnerships with not just people inside the workplace, but outside. So as I spoke very early on about drugs in society, well, we're not the only business that's faced with it, and we're not the only business with employees, but why, why can't I go to, to the council and have a chat to the council, have a, have a chat to their community development area and say, what are you guys doing in relation to drugs and alcohol in society? Do you have um, forums where members of the public can come along? Can we tag along to that? Can we share resources, that kind of thing? So um, it was all of this supportive approach and just might add in there that second point there about leadership engagement it was spoken about before but that's vitally important get your leaders engaged it makes it so much more easier if you can have your leaders on board and they know why you're doing it at first we've got a bit of resistance because especially with the blanket testing uh, it would take a little bit of time because each test takes about 20 25 minutes and then if you get a non-negative result there's going to be a whole chain of custody um, but if we have that leadership support and engagement with those guys, they realise that that half an hour might have just saved a life and might have saved them standing up in court, yes, Your Honour. So um, get that, those guys on board first. So spoke about involving family members before as well. So we've all got family out there. They're all dear, dear to us. And why not throw the doors open so that the kids, our kids and our, our uncles and our brothers and our sisters can get involved in this process as well. So the actual was drug and alcohol awareness sessions where the consultant comes in and gives a presentation on drugs and alcohol, the drug classes, what they do, how they work, how your body processes them, etc., etc., etc. There's a big mental health component to this as well. So we needed to focus on that as well. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not just about safety. It's about safety, it's about workplace health and it's about health and well-being of individuals so if we can achieve the things that we set out to achieve the workplace is going to be a, a better place and I think the biggest part of it is the openness and honesty that we've that we've shown throughout this process that we can put our hand on our heart and say we have done our best to support a person through a process so if they do have a non-negative result they're not just out the door we actually do go through a, a, a structured approach to getting them rehabilitated or giving them assistance, etc., etc. So progress, how far have we come now? Well now, obviously it should have been, and it probably was, but it's mandatory after every incident to have a test. Um, so we have rolled out drug and alcohol education and awareness sessions pretty much across the whole business, and we plan to capture the areas that we haven't got in the next couple of months. Um, and we've completed our initial round of target testing so that um, I'd say 90% of people in the business have all had a test, at least one. Uh, and now we've started our implementation of our random testing program where um, there will be a test each site a month. So that will be different days, different times, etc., etc. Uh, and now we're educating a lot more around the course testing and putting a process in around course testing so that if somebody does feel that their workmate's not quite right, they can put their hand up and, and uh, ask for a course test. So the results were pretty typical, um, that there was an initial spike in non-negative results. Um, and a lot of those, the feedback that we got from the people was a lot of them admitted to using, but
but they said things like, I was on my off shift, I was on my downtime. Um, so we educated to them that it's not preferable, but we're not the fun police. And if they choose to partake in that activity, they've got to make sure they're fit for work. So the education was all around that fitness for work. So that initial spike happened, but then as the program came in, it came down. Uh, and the, the random program's been going since uh, the beginning of March, and we've not had one non-negative result. The whole push is that we're willing to help you if you're willing to help yourself. So that was that collaborative approach, and especially that awareness on how your home life impacts on your work life. So we did draw a line in the sand and we basically went through the process, we education and awareness, gave people that amnesty period and we've drawn a line in the sand now. You guys know what's expected of you, this is what we expect of you as a worker, this is what you're getting paid to do, this is, this is how you should present for work. So, and of course there's been that mental health um, issue all the way along too where people have actually come up and put their hands up and said I have a problem. It's not with drugs and alcohol but it's with other things and we've been able to help them with that as well. And that has resulted in that slight culture shift. I can't stand up here and say we've had a massive culture shift, but you can just see that slight shift now in, in behaviour of people. So that's been really encouraging. So that's pretty much our, my story and, and our little journey, but I'm happy to ask questions about, answer questions about things that uh, specifically. Um, yeah, Stuart, it sounded like you were uh, suggesting that you do actually have an employee assistant plan in place, a program in place, so people can self-select for that prior to, say, getting a, a non-negative result in a, in, a, in a drug or alcohol screen. Yeah, and look, I think the important thing with an, e an EAP, an employee assistance program, is to make sure you consult with, with them um, so that you can be comfortable that they've actually got the resources to deal with the issues, because a lot of EAPs, or some EAPs, um, aren't quite focused on, on the areas that, that um, are presented with drug and alcohol and addiction, addiction problems. So make sure that I would suggest that you have four or five different resources for an EAP, but definitely the, the option is open and at, we work with our HR department to sit with an individual and have like almost like a triage of that individual before we recommend who they go to. Totally voluntary, totally confidential, all of that, but yeah. But they can self-select for that Correct. prior to a, a Correct. drug screen. Yes. Uh, and secondarily, do you have a system that um, embraces not just the alcohol and drug, illicit drug situation, but the uh, abuse of prescribed medications as well? Yes, that's all part of the policy as well. So the policy is, is quite succinct in relation to declaring medications and if they're going to cause you know, effects at work. But the drug all of those drug classes are covered in our education and awareness session, so it's not just illicit, illicit it is uh, prescription as well. Right, thank you very much. Don't panic, Stuart, it's not a hard one. Thanks, Josh. Um, <laughs> do you still find, even though people are almost, I guess it's random testing, people have always got in the back of their mind, am I going to be tested today? Yeah. Um, are they still trying to push the envelope and sort of um, pushing their luck in terms of, oh, phew, I got away with that one again? Those 20 beers last night didn't register this morning? Yeah. Um, yeah, look, we do. The, typically, you, you, you get that response from people. But we've been working very closely with our providers at looking at the times and dates. And what we've actually what we've actually found is that we don't have to be the people that that push with the workers. It's the co-workers, and because they drew the line in the sand themselves, they were the ones that said enough's enough. I don't want to be coming to work with Josh in the office next to me, who's you know not acting right because he's putting me at risk. So we've actually had, and it's it's a lot of the older generation workers are saying. Thank God you're doing this because we were a bit worried about these younger kids that were partying and whatever, and they're putting me at risk. So, yeah, it, yeah, you do get a few of them that still think that they can, they're beating a system. And look, the initial results, and I'm, I'm anecdotally, I've got no evidence of it, but I think the equipment that we were using, these guys were the ones that were using it, probably wasn't picking up the drug classes that we expected it to. So that was a bit of an issue in itself. So that's why we went external to com make it complete. We'd be the equipment was owned by the, the external people. They maintain it, and it's completely out of our hands. So the response that we got from a lot of the guys that got non-negatives initially 
was that, oh, you're, you're using different equipment on us now and all of this kind of stuff. So that was a bit of a discussion with the unions. But the reality of it was that, that these guys, the pr what would happen is they would have a, an initial non-negative, sent off to the laboratory for a test, would come back and it'd be under the cutoff. So it's a bit like a shot over the bow for them. So that's when we use the opportunity to use the education and awareness to say, hey, you know, you might think you're doing the right thing here, but and you could do that in the past because the equipment we had wasn't picking it up. Now it is. So I don't know if I've answered your question, Josh, but it's it's yeah, it sort of paints the picture. No, that's good. Thank you. Um, just one last one, Stuart, in regards to the fact if I'm about to start a shift um, at the workplace, um, is there a capacity for me to self-test before I cross the line and commence my shift? Yeah, yeah there is. Um, we self-test for alcohol only, not for drugs. The drugs are illicit, illegal, so we're not going to enter that argument. We also had this discussion with the union, but there is the opportunity. Um, the guys still have the, uh, the, breath, the handheld breathalyzer, so they can actually um, put their hand up and self-test. Uh, and then that will f a process will follow that. But for illicit drugs, we've taken a stance and said no. If you want to test, if you've admitted that you've had ice the night before or when, whenever it is, or cocaine, we're not going to even entertain that because you, we, we, we don't want any of that in our workplace. So for alcohol, yes, but for illicit drugs, no. Uh, your question on uh, marijuana, THC, they say it stays in the system 10 days plus for testing. How does, how do you handle that one? Um, that was that's a very good question, and that, that came part. That was probably one of the the most asked questions in relation to our education and awareness sessions. Um, there, there is no definitive answer to that because these days I don't don't know. I'm not a user, but the information I've been given is that these days you don't know. There's hydroponically grown stuff. You don't know. It, it's a natural THC occurs naturally in, in in those plants. You don't know what level it is, so you're rolling the dice. So there's no definitive answer with that. With alcohol, it's labelled and you can take a bit of a punt, even though body shape, body size, fitness is going to affect that. But with illicit drugs, no. And that was the education and awareness stuff that we, we pushed. We said, look, we understand where you're coming from. You're better off trying to get off the gear. We'll help you do that. If you can't, you're rolling the dice and you, you, there is no definitive answer as to how long it stays into your system for because you just don't know what's in it. Yeah, and uh, sorry, second question. Where, where did you actually get your help with the policy writing and your decision making so as that it was fair? I know you went to the unions as well, but yep. you must have had some, you know, unless you're an expert in it, you don't know. Yeah, Yeah. no, exactly. That's where we engaged the um, the external consultants who, who did the drug testing. Don't, don't think this is the forum to mention their names, but out, outside of this I can have a chat to you who it was. But um, part of the brief was that we wanted assistance with them, with their experiences with other businesses and industries on writing the policy. So we took our existing policy, sat down, did a review, then we got some um, legal advice on it as well just to get it ticked off. Then we took it to the unions, but there was no argument from the union. They couldn't, there was nothing in there that was not unreasonable. So, But I can talk to you after this session about that. I've just got a question over here. Um, I'm assuming that Hewan has contractors as well, and how do you manage your contractors with this policy? When we do, well, it's part of our induction, so when we induct our, our contractors, they must, like all of our policies, they must ab abide by those. Um, and our random, pr random process is that when the testers come on site, they have a generator, so they, they know each site how many people are there, and we have a, have a, a buffer zone for sickness and for other people being on site. We also have a component for contractors as well. So when they run their little algorithm and it pumps out numbers, it doesn't pump out names, it pumps out numbers, uh, those numbers are then correlated and if a contractor's on that list, they get tested as well. And we have had positive results from contractors in the past as well. So we just treat them as the same as our normal employees. Well, our next speaker uh, is very special because you may remember in our promotional flyer that uh, we had Andrew Tabor to speak on di diving safety. Unfortunately, Andrew isn't able to participate today, but um, very graciously, um, Professor David Smart 
uh, who is medical co-director of Department of Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine at the Royal, has um, offered to stand in and speak around these issues. So Professor David Smart um, is Medical Co-Director and Senior Visiting Specialist at the Royal Hobart Department of Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine, also uh, an Emergency Medicine Specialist, 30 years plus experience in diving medicine, as well as being an active diver himself, over 2,500 hours logged underwater, has published over 150 scientific papers and abstracts on diving medicine, Keen interest in occupational health and safety, and in 2015 he was awarded the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society uh, Award for excellent contributions to the commercial diving industry. So uh, I would like you all to welcome uh, Professor David Smart. Thanks, Pam. I'll just advance this with a, a down arrow, I guess. Um, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and present today. Uh, I have cobbled together at uh, reasonably short notice a, a talk uh, with some perspectives that hopefully will be useful to today's discussions and conversation. Um, what I plan to do is, uh, having been around for around 30 years and seen the whole uh, industry develop in Tasmania with diving right across uh, multiple sectors, um, I'll provide a few stats, we'll look at some decompression illness and, and research uh, that's been uh, done at our facility that hopefully has helped industry. Diver training and risk, uh, we'll cover that as well. And uh, in particular, look at hooker diving as a risk, uh, look at some emergency procedures and my perspectives on, on that, and uh, diver health. And finally, uh, a bit of an update on the future of the Royal Hobart Hospital Hyperbaric Chamber. So we'll kick off just a few things. We get about 35 uh, cases of decompression illness a year at Royal Hobart Hospital and put that into perspective, there's uh, about 20,000 recreational divers in Tasmania. Uh, so that's a, that's a fair whack of uh, numbers and a bit over 1,000 occupational divers. So if you look at the occupational divers end up at about 40% of our activity at the chamber um, out of a, a population of 1,000 but the thing is they're doing a lot more diving uh, than recreational divers, your average occupational divers you know, doing hundreds of, hundreds of hours a year as a recreational diver might hop in the water only about 20 times. So um, recent years, in fact, last year, I just got the stats, I, we haven't done uh, the uh, drilling down and everything uh, for, for the last 12 months, but it's only 15 divers have been treated uh, in the last 12 months, which has been great because we've been under assault. Our whole chamber has been uh, rebuilt as a result of the hospital's foundations being one metre away from the previous chamber we had for 25 years. So we had to actually build a new one on site in my office, uh, bring it in by a crane, and we're using that temporarily until we get a state-of-the-art facility in the new K block uh, in the next 18 months. Um, we also see about 100 other incidents from divers, which are non-disparic injuries, which we talk about. Uh, they're not decompression illness, they're things like ears and, and other problems associated with equipment or injuries to the divers that are not serious. Bit of a background, and the reason I'm doing this is because just to give you a perspective that often decompression illness is underdiagnosed and under thought of as a, as a cause for symptoms. And most symptoms come on in less than six hours with the divers after their dive, but up to 48 hours can be uh, a, a sort of reasonable time frame depending on whether or not there's triggers. And um, the earlier symptoms tend to be more severe. But the most common injury, illness people get is like the flu. It's a constitutional illness where you just get some aches and pains, a bit of headache and you're not feeling well, uh, you might be tired, you can't concentrate, and a lot of people don't even recognise that as being an illness. They just sort of go home and, uh, and don't report it in the first instance. And I think awareness of this sort of syndrome uh, after diving is an important thing for uh, supervisors and the divers themselves. Um, the classic of sort of getting the aches and pains with musculoskeletal pains tends to affect the arms greater than the legs, and the shoulders are the most frequently uh, affected joint for most people. But you can have migratory pains, uh, uh, get be in the back one moment, in the side, the hip, whatever, uh, because bubbles are right throughout the body. They're not actually a uh, you know, single joint uh, phenomenon. The worst case scenario, people would get impaired high mental function, and sometimes that affects their judgment in terms of calling for help. They just don't know they need to call for help, and recreational divers are classics in this regard. They spend a couple of days in a sort of a fugue state of delirium and not actually understanding that what's happened to their body has been a neurological decompression illness. Worst case scenario can go right through to quadriplegia or paraplegia um, or even death, so it affects right throughout the body. 
Um, a simple rule of thumb is if you're well before a dive and a diver then comes up and is unwell after the dive and in the immediate post-dive period, um, yeah, up to perhaps 48 hours, it's worthwhile getting uh, a medical assessment. Um, not always will it be due to diving, but uh, in, in a lot of cases it, uh, it will be, particularly the ones that occur in that first six hours after the dive. Um, this is me in a former life as a um, sort of star in the black internet. Um, but the, uh, there's no actual tests uh, that you can do as a, as a medico uh, to determine that someone has decompression illness. It's a clinical diagnosis. So supervisors of diving and divers themselves are empowered because they don't recognise these symptoms as well as a doctor can recognise it if it's uh, after the dive. So a few interventions just to emphasise. Early appropriate first aid oxygen treatment makes a big difference for divers of decompression illness. If someone gets symptoms and they're put on oxygen and they're managed with it, it will actually lead to one in eight of those divers becoming asymptomatic by the time they're ready for the recompression chamber. That's a fantastic result. You know, you get, uh, for every eight divers you give oxygen to, uh, you actually treat, have one of them asymptomatic. If you compare it with heart attack data, when we give these clot-busting drugs, in emergency, you have to treat 200 people to actually have one extra person benefit. So oxygen, one in eight, that's a really good result. The other thing it does is it reduces the severity and the length of treatment. If they're treated well in the first place, you start to get nitrogen out of your body early uh, and you get them under pressure. The number of treatments we need to give the diver are less when they get to us. So uh, if someone suspects decompression illness, oxygen is a very good intervention that can be done in the field. Uh, and uh, even if the symptoms are uncertain before, while you're getting advice, it makes a big difference to the diver. Second thing is early recompression treatment improves outcomes. So if we get actually, um, the, this is, is a general population that includes neurological and the less severe syndromes of decompression illness. If we treat them less than 24 hours, 90% of them will have full recovery in, in association with the treatment. Whereas if we delay everything after 24 hours, we get people with ongoing symptoms uh, in about 50% of cases and they take a lot longer to settle down. Neurological decompression illness, that's a different kettle of fish. It's an emergency we need to actually bring people in as quick as possible. And uh, not long ago we had a, a fellow uh, diving uh, who was brought in by helicopter, uh, a recreational diver, and he was brought into us within three hours, got him under pressure and his whole neurological uh, decompression illness resolved in the first treatment. Uh, so the earlier the better. Time is brain. Um, I've been asked in the past by some companies, how do we eliminate their compression illness? And I appreciate Ian's uh, zest for zero harm, uh, but um, there isn't a way of eliminating decompression illness unless you engineer all the divers out of the water. Uh, we are humans going into an alien environment, so as soon as we go into an alien environment, there's a degree of risk associated with it. And it's a bit like, I describe it like a game of Russian roulette. You've got 10,000 bullets uh, chambers available, and if you enter the water, you've got three sitting in the chambers already. So you spin the wheel, three out of 10,000 chance on balance will end up with some degree of decompression illness. But the important thing is that, uh, if, you, if you do lots of other incorrect actions, you know, uh, rapid ascents, uh, staying down too long, really deeper diving and everything, you actually increase the chance of a hit so that more bullets get added into the chamber. And some divers I see, unfortunately, uh, probably put themselves in a 50-50 chance of a hit uh, by doing uh, things that are not correct. Um, that in particular relates to the recreational industry where they've got no training sometimes, they're just going to get absolutely guaranteed to have a problem. Um, what I'm saying though is that if you do get decompression illness and everything's been done the right way, in most cases there'll be mild cases of decompression illness that are completely resolved and they're like a minor injury, like if you you know, twist your ankle or something like that. Um, the harm that results from it, if you're looking for zero harm, in, in the perhaps, uh, you know, the, what, within one week of the actual incident, ends up being zero because the person is better again from treatment. So I think you can achieve that sort of thing, but you're probably not going to achieve zero uh, decompression illness rate with diving. And just to give you an example of why, um, dive tables have been calculated uh, really to try and uh, put a mathematical model to a biological situation and you can't actually you know, turn humans into an on-off phenomenon. You end up with a bell curve of risk in any sort of situation. So the US Navy tables, they were, when they were first brought out, they had less than one in 20 chance of getting decompression illness. And in fact, they still um, work by that. 
the way they get around it is they have you know, amazingly fit divers, uh, like Darren, for example, right? um, and uh, they, uh, you know, entering the environment in their 20s, and uh, they are uh, obeying a lot of uh, rules the way they operate in the Navy, and they can get away with having a much lower incidence than that, even though the tables, if they were dive to the limits, would produce you know, about every fifth diver having, de uh, sorry, every 20th diver having decompression illness. Um, there are dive computers around these days which can limit risk and they use a model called Bulliman model which is, uh, gives a 2% or 1 in 50 risk. The reason why most people don't have 1 in 50 risk is because they actually add safety factors in like doing decompression stops or diving inside computer limits. And um, finally there's a couple of others that are used and in particular the DCIM tables I do down, mention down there at, at the bottom which are the tables that are used by industry to guide us in uh, most of the diving practices. And they have about a 1 in 200 risk if you dive them absolutely to the limit without doing a, any, any forms of safety uh, you know, ad added to the equation. So these are all guides that help us in reducing safety, but they can't eliminate uh, episodes. And uh, there is a balance between getting productivity underwater and, and having um, the safety. And this is an example here too. Uh, as you go deeper, the actual uh, dive tables get riskier, so you have a higher chance of getting decompression illness. Um, and so for a given dive table time at, say, 30 metres, you, you might have four times the risk at 30 metres than what you have diving at 18 metres. Uh, even though the table is the same, this is the table limit, it's not an equal risk table, because if you had an equal risk table, you'd get no productivity at 30 metres. Uh, at the moment, the DCIM tables have a, uh, a risk, uh, uh, sorry, they have a limit of 15 uh, minutes at uh, 30 metres. If you had an equal risk to keep it the same as the risk at 18 metres, you'd probably have to bring it down to seven or eight minutes. By the time you do your descent for two minutes and you end up down, you get five minutes of dive time. So you don't, uh, that, what we've got to recognise is as we dive deeper, and I see trends in the salmon industry now, people are diving deeper, 30 metre pens and things like that. What, what we have to take into account is that deeper diving, there's a trade off of productivity and risk and uh, we need to sort of consider ways of reducing that. The other thing we have is the multi-level diving and risk. This is what computers do perfectly and some industries use computers frequently. I know the scientific divers do that uh, in, in the background as well as logging uh, their dives uh, in paper. But if you take this uh, curve here and we get to the traditional dive would be A, A, A B, um, D, E uh, on, on this dive curve. Um, oh, sorry, F, A, B, D, F. Uh, coming up to the surface. Um, but if a diver doesn't dive to the full depth uh, and all that blue area that's shaded uh, is not used, um, the computer gives them extra time to be able to dive. And it's called multi-level diving. And it says, right, by the time you get to D, um, you actually uh, would be told to go up by a standard dive table. But in fact, the computer says, no, you can start at E and you can keep it cross going there. Uh, off to the point uh, X and then uh, head up to the surface. And that increases your risk because if something goes wrong uh, with the dive towards the end of the dive, you haven't got the safety margin of what you've got in the uh, first part of the dive uh, from time that hasn't been spent at depth. Um, and that's not appreciated by quite a few people that the, the computers themselves will push them further. Another one's reverse profile diving and risk. People have been uh, indicated this is, this is anti the physiological uh, sort of knowledge that we have. You should be actually getting shallower progressively as you dive because you'll load up more nitrogen if you dive deeper on, on a subsequent dive. And um, there are workshops around that say reverse dive profile uh, is actually safe. Um, that particular workshop um, said that absence of evidence equals evidence of absence. In other words, nobody had studied whether or not they're safe, so therefore there was no evidence proving that there was a risk. So they said, right, oh, now it's evidence of absence, we can actually dive reverse profiles. Studies done at um, Sydney on guinea pigs doing uh, dives that went 36, 24, 12 metres versus dives that went 12, 24, 36. All the guinea pigs died who did reverse dive profiles or had serious episodes of decompression illness compared with the ones that did the 24, uh, 36, 24, 12, getting shallower, they all survived. So I don't need to do that on humans. That's enough evidence for me, that, and it goes with the physiology, that you shouldn't be doing these sort of dives, second, deeper ones. Tasmanian salmon in industry, the good old days. So back in 1990, that's how far I go back. In fact, my first case from the uh, industry was 1986 that I, um, that I managed. 
And um, there were a lot of problems identified in the industry at the time, and an occupational health and safety review was undertaken. Uh, this paper is available on the internet. Um, Peter McCartney and I wrote it in uh, SPUM's journal at that time. Um, following that paper, uh, a lot of the things that we identified, the industry had already identified these uh, issues as well. And there was a while I was away in um, South Australia and Western Australia working, um, there was a lot of work done to get the industry on track with having health standards, improved training, and, and I guess limits placed on the bounce diving and also um, an, an, you know, safety culture, and, and that reduced the incidents themselves. But we assisted that with uh, further research when we came back in, uh, um, when I was back in Tassie by 1995, and we got going and in the uh, late 90s and early uh, noughties, we, uh, we did some work in the field, and I'll show you a few things from that. So. Um, what, what we did was Doppler work where we measure the bubbles in the actual um, circulation uh, immediately post-dive and see whether they're high risk. So here's on the shoulder. That's bubbles going through the circulation back to the heart. And I'll do this one, which is the heart itself. That's after squatting and a whole shower of bubbles goes back to the heart. So every diver produces bubbles during their dives. Don't get me wrong, we're, we're alien in this environment and the only way we can get away with it is our lungs filter out those bubbles. So we have to have what's called silent bubbles, that's the best way you can do it. Um, Corey Vandenbroek, who's our chief tech, is a very senior and respected researcher and is one of the few certified Doppler technicians in the world who analyses and is able to grade these bubbles and give meaningful results out of them uh, in relation to uh, their impact. And we, uh, we linked all that research with dive data printouts with the divers, and um, some, of, some of the divers in the uh, audience would recognise these sort of profiles looking inside a, a salmon pen uh, and then moving to the next pen and, and so on to the end of it. But there was, at that time, there was no uh, guidance for this bounce diving, yo-yo uh, diving as they call it, because it, all dive tables had been geared around a single descent, staying at the bottom and then coming back up the surface. So with our uh, Doppler work, we are able to actually show um, that in the uh, couple of hours post-dive, you can detect bubbles in most of the divers, and once they hit about 40 microns in size, and we can pick them up with our um, Doppler equipment. And that enabled us then to um, grade the risk and work out some meaningful tables. And to give an example, we actually started, we, we've got some validated tables which we published in the paper in 2014, um, which uh, originally there were some restrictions on uh, bounce, bounces that the salmon farmers, uh, salmon farm divers could do. And uh, we were able to show that we could actually uh, increase the numbers of bounces and keep the Doppler uh, counts low and enable them to have increases in productivity with the number of pens they could actually dive on and, and go through. Um, that data has been published now. This is old and I'm, I'm pleased to see Ian's data further showing benefits in the 2010 uh, period uh, following. But uh, if you look at the aquaculture industry after we uh, got involved, uh, what we had was a progressive reduction in numbers of cases. Now, you don't need to put that in perspective because in that time there's an exponential growth in the increase in amount of diving that was being done in the industry as well as a tonnage of fish being produced out of the industry. So the raw numbers are really good but it's actually better if you look at the numbers per number of um, dives and uh, the whole industry uh, with the surveys we did over that period of time showed reductions from 26 uh, per 10,000 dives down to um, sort of less than one per 10,000 dives which is a terrific result. If you put it in perspective, if the original incidence of diving accidents had taken place now, we'd be treating 300 cases of decompression illness a year out of the aquaculture industry alone. And we usually treat about five or six. So that's quite good, uh, very impressive. But I do regard aquaculture diving as high risk diving. It's not just a simple seafood harvesting diving. This is diving around structures. It's got heavy lifts and cranes and uh, we've got overhead environments, we've got pumps and we've got delta P changes in pressure around the place. This type of diving, in my opinion, is industrial and we need to maintain the processes of keeping the divers up to date with their training so that they're actually qualified for the developments as they occur and they're competent for the matching the, the needs of the industry as new technology comes in. Because technology will exceed the human body's ability to do things. 
Um, so my opinion is that the highest level risk mitigation is an appropriate training of divers. That enables the, uh, the divers to be appropriately tasked and able to be skilled to match what they need to do. They need to be able to recognise and fix safety problems when they're actually diving uh, and, and they need to be able to speak up. They've got an empowerment to speak up. If you're not educated in the field and you don't have a culture that sort of supports you, you can't speak up. Everyone poo poos you, oh, I can just you know, shut up and you know, hide that one away, we won't, uh, you know, we won't take it forward. So there needs to be that empowerment and that culture and I'm pleased to see the uh, previous presentations. Another risk that's occurring, we've moved to the west coast, so we've got Tassie now with a lot of operations around uh, Macquarie Harbour and uh, you'll notice that the highest parts on this graph, uh, sorry this map of Tassie uh, are um, on the west coast of sort of eight, nine hundred metres uh, being traversed by the divers when they come back uh, either to the uh, Hobart site or whatever. So there's an Australian standard that governs that and this is where we've been plugging for our altitude chamber which we're most grateful to all industry uh, support that we've had in, in successfully getting that implemented for our um, hyperbaric chamber. Uh, we'll be able to do depressurising as well as pressurising for treatment and do research. But this whole table has been based on expert opinion. So at the moment, if you, for example, you dive on the west coast, you do a standard uh, category one dive or even a category two dive, you're going to be waiting 12 or 24 hours before you can travel back. And I'm sure that uh, that's been tested uh, by the, uh, the various uh, industry uh, people that I'm not sure they all wait 12 hours um, in coming back. So maybe we've actually already tested the, uh, the water, but we need to do proper research on that to work it out. Hooker diving now, a bit of a, a cook's tour of this. The worst, worst risk in hooker diving is um, an uncontrolled ascent due to out of air situation. And it's one of my bugbears. I'm, I'm, this is a pre completely preventable situation. It does not need to occur. Um, there's risks in Tasmania of entanglement, you know, loss of weight belts, all those sort of things. And, uh, and also risk from the, um, the person uh, having their hose cut off, uh, risk from the hooker pump cutting out. And um, one of the things that hasn't been embraced in the industry, I've seen three, uh, three divers, I won't say which industry, have had their hoses cut by propellers. And that they've then been out of air and had to race to the surface from 15 or 20 metres. And that ends up, can be a catastrophic situation with a major neurological bend and bubbles in the brain. So propeller guards are a, a risk mitigation strategy, but they're not embraced because they result in about a 15% reduction in efficiency of the boat and engine speed and all sorts of things like that. But um, that is a, a norm in the Navy. They have to be there. Um, the other thing is that is an absolute mandatory, in my opinion, and uh, I uh, have had input to the Abalone stand in relation to this because they don't require the bailout cylinder to be mandatory unless it's 15 metres of depth diving. Um, and the, a bailout cylinder, in my opinion, should be mandatory for every dive if you're on a hooker. You should not be diving without it because it turns an out of air situation into a casual walk in the park. You pull your rag in, you put it in your mouth, and you casually go to the surface. And if you're entangled, you can cut your hose. You can get out of the situation. Uh, but uh, if you don't have the bailout, you're going up to the surface at a rate of knots. Now, the shallowest I've seen someone rupture their lungs has been two metres. You do not do need to dive deep. This is why accessory air is important. And particularly if you're entangled, you need time just to undo it or whatever. Um, so that results in the serious ends of the spectrum, which are not the, uh, the champagne bubble um, scenario of letting the pressure off, but these ones are due to rupturing the lungs where gas gets in the circulation and goes directly to the brain. And you can be dead in seconds in, in that sort of situation. Um, this is not an acceptable air supply. They've got about three breaths in them. They're called spare air. You can buy them in like a spray can and it's got a regulator and everything. You need to have volume that's reasonable to give you about probably quarter hour, half hour of um, breathing to get yourself out of a pickle. Air purity is not tested generally in hooker and I'll be surprised if uh, many people have actually got um, certificates to say that they've been testing their own device for uh, air purity, but it's an area that we see carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, with the recreational industry in particular, there's been some deaths in our state and other states due to um, carbon monoxide going down the, the tube to the divers underwater and uh, killing them. Uh, by the way, that needs to be done every six months, the air testing on the Australian standard. And um, one of the things we see is how many, you know, uh, Divers actually just use sanitary pads rather than a commercial proper air filter that you know, takes out a lot of the uh, impurities uh, for their uh, diving hooker apparatus. 
So diver rescue, another bugbear of mine. It needs to be practised. And um, I ask the question of most people, when did they last practise? Have they done it in um, a scenario of uh, difficult weather? Because it's all right to just do a nice calm bay scenario. What's it like when you've got the boat rocking around and, and seeing whether or not you can get someone into the boat? And um, has the emergency call system, a lot of the divers in Tasmania dive in very remote areas, and they might be two, three hours away, have they tested the ability to actually get the message to the emergency services for their pickup and everything like that so that they can actually come to the chamber in an uh, expeditious manner? Um, how's the team going to get the diver into the boat when you've only got one deckhand and an abalone diver underneath the sea? Is there, is there a mechanism? If you've practised it, at least you can do it when it happens. You've got an, unco uh, or an you know, uncooperative uh, limp diver that you've got to get back, in the water, uh, back into the boat. Um, if there's oxygen, does the team know how to use it? And then, you know, a very important intervention. Uh, so in that circumstance, uh, there should be enough. And just an example here, your standard little seaside cylinder, which a lot of people carry around, they only got about half an hour of oxygen. If you're going to be remote diving around the south coast of Tasmania, you actually need e-cylinders or, or even bigger that you can have four hours or five hours of oxygen for an injured, injured diver, not a couple of little cylinders just sitting there that you're going to run out after half an hour because you're in the same boat as what you were when you started uh, with the case of decompression illness. Diver health, annual medical checks. Um, there's a few groups that don't really adhere to that uh, in, in the present stage. And a lot of it's not a policing process. It's a, sometimes there can be proactive things that are, you, know, you pick up. A lot of the divers I see for health checks, and I'm not, I'm not touting for business. There's a lot of other doctors that do diver health checks, but um, a lot of divers I see, I'm the only medical contact they have. They don't have a general practitioner. Women seem to be much better at getting regular health checks. Blokes just wait until there's a bloody disaster when they're 65 and they have an infarct and everyone said, oh, never saw that coming. Uh, but they never, never had a look at it either. Um, and the results of not um, treating decompression illness are divers bone rot. And the only industry I see bone rot in, uh, just barricade in a crisis, is the abalone industry. Um, and, and what I'd have to say is this is a completely preventable condition. And the worst case at the moment, seeing some younger divers, well under 40, with the condition. And it's completely preventable because it's now recognised as actually being a series of untreated decompression illness episodes that lead to the bone dying. And then what happens is they have to have a hip replacement or a shoulder replacement or something like that. And if you have to have this sort of thing done when you're in your 30s, these operations, despite medical marvels only last about 12, 15 years at the best. And then you might have to have a redo of a redo, you end up with a pelvis that doesn't work, hasn't got anything attached to. So completely preventable uh, as a result of proper diving practice. Diver emergencies in Tasmania, it's pretty easy, triple O. If the, if the, and if you need, obviously the uh, hospital is always contactable and there's a 24 hour service of on call from diving medical specialists who can provide advice. But if there's a really serious emergency, it's a triple O call, say it's a diving emergency, and they will then um, get the specialists involved and we'll look at retrievals and get involved with those sort of things. Our specialists at the unit are involved uh, with advising the retrieval service as well, and we've, we've uh, as a result of our emergency medicine background, uh, are pretty good at uh, and, and anaesthetics and ICU, are pretty good at handling those sort of things by advice. So a few take home messages, I guess. Um, occupational diver training is a critical aspect that I'd say has to be at the highest level for the types of um, diving that's taking place or even exceed it. And particularly occupational diving supervisor training. The supervisors have to be better qualified than the divers. They've got to spot you know, risks that are occurring in the environment. That includes command and control if there's other activities taking place like cranes being operated when the divers are there. The dive supervisor has to be the boss of the whole operation because if they've got divers where there's a hazardous environment and someone else is not even on the same radio you know, frequency or something like that, then that can be a hazard. Um, the, the emergency plans need to be practised and, and uh, regularly followed. Um, early recognition of symptoms and advice for decompression illness so I, I advise as well. Um, oxygen, first aid and adequate supplies are very important. The bailout cylinder should be mandatory for all hooker dives and, and air purity testing. And really, we, we are available to provide advice uh, and uh, in, in a non-judgmental fashion, um, if you work in emergency, you don't end up judging people, OK? Um, because we get all sorts of amazing stuff come through the door there. And if we were judgmental, you just wouldn't practice. 
Um, so what I say is that our hyperbaric staff don't bite. Uh, we actually want to keep people healthy in the water. That involves prevention and obviously early treatment. So a last bit on um, an update on our chamber. You'll see top left there is the original chamber that we operated in the garage when I was an intern in the 80s, uh, followed by the Peter McCartney chamber that's sort of yellowish in the middle there. Uh, that one had to be decommissioned and because of the hospital rebuild, we've had to last 12 months go through a complete rebuild of our own department and install this chamber in my old office, uh, which uh, the one in the middle to the bottom. Um, swung in by a big crane about a year ago. We're operating that as our diver chamber at the moment, which is actually a step back from the previous chamber, but we're heading towards the future, which is from 2020 onwards, we will have that massive shipping container one there, which is a square container, it's like being in a hospital room, and we'll have a triple lock. We can treat our routine patients on one side, diver emergencies and ICU patients on the other side, with a full bed just going into it. So. Um, that's the way of the future. It's an exciting time for us. We've been through some pretty tough times. Um, perhaps there might be time for questions. I'm not sure. I've gone a little bit over time. Apologies. Well, thank you very thank much, you. David. Excellent. Excellent presentation. Thank you. So uh, just before our final speaker today, um, Brett Hislop from WorkSafe Tasmania. If you'd all like just to stand and stretch just for a moment, um, and uh, we'll be moving on in a, a just a minute or so, so not a long break. Thank you, Brett. Okay, um, we'll now start our final session just to keep on time. Senior Inspector Brett Hislop has been with WorkSafe uh, Industry, Industry Safety Branch South since June 2016. He has approximately 20 years safety experience and has worked in a variety of industry sectors over that period. Brett has 10 years practical experience working in marine science research as a technical advisor holds commercial diving qualifications and has been a diving instructor with PADI and NASDS. 
He has also been a marine safety advisor with Boscalis Australia on the Gorgon and Wheatstone projects in northwest Western Australia and with Boscalis International on the Malampaya gas platform off the Philippines, South China Sea. He has extensive marine background and working knowledge of the aquaculture and commercial harvesting sectors. Uh, so Brett will now give us uh, an overview of the fishery sector from a WorkSafe Tasmania view. Well, I, I guess the, uh, the lucky part about going last is I don't have to cover everything everyone's done before. So I think the presentations, I think the presentations have been really good and I think they've highlighted the challenges that the industry faces at the moment. So I thought rather than going like from our side of it, I thought it was better just to do uh, like an overview. Uh, an overview. So if you look at the sectors broken into a number of groups, so you've got aquaculture, uh, commercial diving in relation to the support with the, to the aquaculture industry, uh, the commercial diving fishery itself, uh, commercial fisheries, the giant crab, rock lobster, scale fishery, scallops and so forth, right, and the fish processing area as well, which we can't leave out, all right. These industries are required to comply with existing legislation, codes of practice um, and industry standards. Um, in 2012, the model WHS legislation came into effect within Tasmania and introduced a number of significant changes. Um, also to recent AMSA um, commercial vessel, uh, for commercial vessels introduced additional measures to enhance um, the safety and include higher levels of competency requirements for masters and crew. Um, a lot of that has been pointed out before through Julie and the rest of it has been embraced within Tasmania but it's also created challenges given the diversity of the, of the sector itself within this state. Um, rapidly expanding groups such as the aquaculture industry and associated commercial diving operations have had, to progress, have, had the, have had to progress their safety management systems to ensure compliance uh, with the Work Health and Safety Act and regulations itself. Once again, you have a, a sector here um, that has the financial and physical resources to um, en encapsulate uh, those changes and they can do so quite easily. If we look back at the other sectors there, the smaller ones, it's difficult for them. So the pace of expansion within aquaculture has introduced a range of, change, uh, of challenges. Um, one of the biggest ones has been a large influx of, uh, of new workers. Most of those are unqualified or inexperienced. Um, as was pointed out before, both through Ian and Stuart's presentations, that has brought in a range, of, um, a range of issues as well. Worker behaviour has been a classic. One of the things that people do when they come from another job into the job they're moving into is they bring their past and present practice with them. So they're as good as what they know until they're taught otherwise. Um, training requirements, once again, um, if you're bringing in people that aren't qualified or don't have the experience, they have to be trained up to the level that people require, that the organisation requires them to have. Uh, procedural development, once again, as the systems mature, their procedures have to mature with them. Um, Stuart pointed out in regards to drug and alcohol testing and that type of thing. Once again, these all have to be brought up and be consistent um, with the organisational view of safety. Uh, also to uh, worker competency. Um, it's okay for people to come in holding a qualification, but generally you don't know how good or how relevant that qualification is. Someone could have earned something, and I always often point out, I've got a, a heavy combination licence, but I haven't driven one for about 20 years. So even though I could produce a licence and say I'm qualified to drive it, it's a big risk for an organisation to place me inside that truck and tell me to go and do my job without assessing my capacity to do that first. Um, also, too, is a continuous review of operational systems, including ongoing change. So it's, it's continual. It has to happen all the time. Right, eh? The broader sector is required to operate in an ever-changing and regulatory and commercial environment which also introduces continuous change. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about the smaller aspects of the, of the fishery itself. So as we talked about before, past and present practice influences behaviour. Um, too often we see people, and we are discussing this before in the table over there, that, um, that even though people have training, they're still prone to go back and do what they were doing before. Or they're embarrassed because if they do something that's different to the norms that they don't feel as if they're compliant and that type of thing. That some of them are 
prone to, uh, how would you put it, being adverse to criticism from other people. Whereas in fact some of that criticism will drive them to unsafe acts rather than safe acts or to better practice. Right. Perceived threats to livelihood create barriers that inhibit adaptability and change. Quite often when I go around and talk to people and we say what needs to be in place, they're telling us the cost. They're looking at how much it's going to cost them to do it. Right. There also, as was pointed out before through Julian's presentation, the uncertainty of access to a resource, about how much of that resource will be available to them. And these are things that they will look at because if they've got a steady and known income, it's easy for them to commit. But when the income becomes erratic or unstable, it's very difficult for them to continue to put um, additional resources and funding into things. The capacity to remain up to date with technology and we're in an environment now in an age where uh, technology changes consistently and rapidly. And it's those that don't keep up with it that fall behind. But there is a cost associated with it and that covers those aspects we've talked about before. Uh, once again, training and competency. Um, even with AMSA and these other changes that are coming out, people have to have more and more training. And that training has to be to a higher level. The demands for the training are becoming more and more. The capacity for trainers to be available to teach those people, right, are putting strain on everything. And also to equipment and maintenance and upgrade. Right? Once again, when costs need to get saved, people tend to look at where they can be. And quite often you'll go around different parts of the industry and look at what's going on and you'll see equipment that is definitely substandard or not being maintained to the level it was. And as um, David pointed out in his presentation, we have people working in very remote locations in probably one of the most hostile um, work environments in the world, which is basically the, the latitude that we, that we, um, we operate in. Righto. Excluding the large employer groups within the sector, the remainder are generally small in size and could be a one-person net fisher or a two-person dive team involved in the wild fisheries harvesting sector. Um, once again, it's the, the, the systems that we spoke of before, is that if you've got a diver and a deckhand on an abalone boat, if something happens to the diver, the deckhand has to get the diver into the boat. The deckhand has to administer first aid. The deckhand has to be able to raise assistance, get on the radio. At the same time, he has to keep the life support up for the person that's on the deck. If they where they are, can someone get to them? How are they going to get to the nearest boat ramp? Are there people nearby that can help? All these things are never tested until they happen. So once again, there's a whole myriad of things that need to be thought out. What we do know that is whenever a serious incident occurs, um, it is the sector that wears the scrutiny and generally gives rise to questions associated with the systems of work. In other words, if something happens, it's usually a broad sweep across the whole lot. So in other words, if one sector is underperforming, it's likely that the whole industry itself is going to suffer as a result of that. And when I say suffer, I don't necessarily mean in a bad way. I mean that it's going to require um, an increase in the way in which things are done, which can result in the implementation of legislation or requirements that add another layer and another cost. So incident investigation often highlights weaknesses and deficiencies within the operation and give rise to the implement, implementation of higher regulation and operational requirements, as we discussed before. Righto. So now's the time to seize the moment. We are where we are now because of what's happened in the past. There's too many times when we walk onto sites and people tell us about why it's like this, why do we have to have that, who implemented this, why is this in place, and they go on. But the reason we are here now is because what previous generations have allowed to happen. And as I said before, through investigation, the identification of all the causal factors that go in there, things are introduced to prevent it happening again. And that's the result of it. And the other part is what will be in place in the future, right, is dependent on what we do now. So all the industry sectors need to look at what the way that they're currently operating and ask, the self, ask themselves the question, are we doing the best we possibly can, right? And if we get it right now, the future generations, the people that follow us on the industry, Right, will have a much better run than we've had as a result of the things that have gone on in the past. Um, I think all the, all the presenters earlier have pointed out the challenges that have existed. 
Um, David showed how things have moved forward, specifically in the diving sector, which is an extreme high risk activity, um, and that type of thing. So the change is, change is good. And change brings on, um, uh, what would you call it? The capacity for people to do things better, but if it's done in an organised way and it's done the right way, then everyone benefits from it. All fishery sectors need to embrace the current requirements and put in place a system that protects their industry and ex from excessive change and regulation in the future. As I said, what we do now will depict what happens in the future. So, how can we do it? Right. One is assess operational risk, right? All aspects. So once again, it doesn't matter whether you're a two-person dive team or uh, a, a scale fishery production vessel or you're working in there, the one thing you need to look at is what do I do, what am I doing, how am I doing it, right, and make sure that you fully understand what your operation is and the risks associated with it. Develop a safe system of work, i.e. have a safety management plan. You need to make sure that everything that you've got in place, right, is there to make things work. We talked before about emergency management. My experience over time has been that people don't think about it until it happens and they believe that what they've got in place is going to work until it happens and then they find that it doesn't. Once again, is the first aid kit up to, up to scratch? Is the oxygen equipment right? Do I have, is the radio working? Do I have the necessary contact details to get in con you know, to, to raise someone? And it goes on like that. As I often say when I'm talking to dive groups when they're doing their training, it's the one thing you don't want to be as a person lying on the floor looking up, thinking to someone, what are you going to do? All right? Everyone seems to think themselves as someone looking down on someone right, that's injured. And it's not always work, it doesn't always work that way. Right -o. Uh, comply with legislative requirements in a manner that is relevant to the size and complexity of your business operation. Once again, I've done safety um, inspections through very large vessels, right, ocean going, international vessels. Their systems need to be very, very advanced. On the other hand, if you've got a boat with an abalone diver and a deckhand, it doesn't need to be. But nonetheless, you need to make sure that it's commensurate with the activity that they're doing so that they, everyone on that vessel knows exactly what they've got to do, where everything is, right, and how they go around it. Ensure competency by completing the training and performing the task safely. Training we've talked about, not only that is making sure that your training is put into practice. If it's one of those things that you only have to do every now and then, then do some additional tests, find out. And a classic example is trying to get a 110 kilo diver in over the side of a boat, right? Right, plan and equip for emergencies. I can't help but stress on this. You know, every group I talk to, they'll pull out an emergency management plan and they'll ask the question, when was the last time you tested it? Or you'll ask someone in the boat, where's the first aid kit? Oh, it's up in the bow, can you grab it for me? And you hear clang, bash, clang, bash, clang, bash. Oh, well, it was here the other week, right? Or the other one, you know, um, where's a knife? If you need a knife, if you have to cut something, where would you find it? And, they, and once again, everyone thinks it's there, but they don't know where it is. So once again, make sure you know exactly what you've got to do and where everything is to do it, right? And once again, contingency planning, what if? What if? Righto. We've talked about it's been covered before, embrace change, it's inevitable. The further, uh, the further you lag behind, the harder it takes to catch up. All right. So once again, it's better to build your system slowly and make sure it's, it's well founded and it's solid than letting it then continually, and this happens a lot, when I talk to people, they'll say, I'm going to get around to that, I'm going to do it. And then industry moves on and people fall, fall further behind. Probably the biggest thing is get assistance to guide you in understanding what is required and how you can achieve compliance. There's too many people out there that you talk to that simply don't know or haven't sought the required knowledge to do what they've got to do. Um, ignorance is no, is no acceptable, you know, sorry, is not acceptable. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge out there that people can access. There's huge amounts of resources. They just need to be guided in the right direction or encouraged to ask the questions and find out. Not all of it's as difficult as what people think it is. Learn from mistakes. The problem with doing the same thing the same way is you inevitably get the same result. I see that all too often. 
people keep doing the same thing and wonder why it doesn't change. So once again, it goes back to that change philosophy. Uh, continue strive to improve your systems of work. Be proactive rather than reactive. Try and think ahead. Try and stop things from happening before they do. But if they do happen, then learn from them. Hope that they're not severe enough to cause you know, injury, harm or significant cost or damage. Um, for those who work in, on or around the water will understand what an unforgiving element it is. I'll just have to read off this. Um, it is continuous state of change and rarely is one moment the same as the nest. The risks associated with it being a work platform, platform are many and varied. Therefore, prior preparation and planning is necessary in order to prevent injury to person or damage to plant and equipment. I think the photos that were shown before, it changes rapidly and quickly. So we just have to be ready for that. Incidents happened because they, were, they weren't foreseen or known contributory factors were ignored. Hindsight is a convenient tool, but foresight is by far the most effective method in trying to prevent something from happening that you may later regret. I don't know how many times we'll do it ourselves. You'll sit in front of the news of an evening and you'll watch something and go, I would have done it differently. I wouldn't have done it like that. But the thing about real-time risk assessment is decisions have to be made like that. And once again, in that process, you need to make sure that you are prepared for it in every possible way. So in closing, um, I brought this up the other day there. Uh, Socrates, I think, isn't it? Yes, right. The um, ancient Greek playwright wrote, I have no desire to suffer twice in reality and then in retrospect. So once again, when things go wrong, we will be judged at the moment, at the time, and then later on through um, hindsight, people will sit there and tell you more and more about what should have happened and how it should have happened. So that's it. Any questions? No, thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of the session. So um, I'm sure you'll agree it's been uh, a fascinating line of speakers uh, right from the beginning with uh, Julian giving us an overview of uh, the seafood industry. On to Ian to talk to us about their journey with culture from dependent to interdependent. A Stuart and the alcohol and drugs program and their approach. Um, again was fascinating and that led us on to Professor David Smart um, with an excellent presentation on, on a diving and um, the necessary work health and safety issues and risks associated with that. And finally finishing up with Brett from his overview uh, from WorkSafe Tasmania. So uh, I'd like you all to join me again in thanking the presenters today. In terms of our next events for Better Work Tasmania, uh, we will be providing and supporting a session on uh, promoting mentally healthy workplaces at the TAVRP conference on the 8th of June, uh, and then a follow-up with the Employer of Choice um, Awards Day on the 3rd of July. So uh, it will be more or less a, a repeat of that. We have. Mark Leopold from Beyond Blue to talk about the sort of um, uh, approaches that Beyond Blue supports for workplaces. And we also have Claire Evans from uh, Pathways to give us insight into their eight stage modular program for building individual resilience and, and building uh, mental health. So um, if you'd like to come along, again, if you're a member, you will get an invitation and you'll be able to register for those events so by all means if you haven't become a member yet and you'd like to join us for those sessions um, just get on site on the, the website and uh, join up you can join through uh, the general work safe Tasmania website you'll see there that there's a, a link for better work Tasmania so uh, thank you all again for participating today um, I personally was fascinated by the information provided and um, I'm sure our online uh, participants have also got a lot out of the session and um, I look forward to seeing you at further sessions. Thank you very much.